Hello friends. This is Fanfic Adventure Plus. How are you all? So in this video, we will see, what if Naruto had the power of Mokuton, Sharingan, and the Kyubi. Here is short summary. Life of Naruto as he goes through the pain of being a Jinshuriki of the Kyubi no Yoko, only to have a bloodline to tame said beast. Bloodline, Mokuton, Sharingan later on. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. He day was old. The sun had set and the entire village lay quiet preparing for the usual peaceful slumber. Darkness was all that could be seen in every alley. The few traces of light flickered in the dying lamps surrounding the street corners. Among the trees surrounding the village stood a tall strikingly beautiful mint green-haired woman. Her name was Hogasha the spirit of Konoha and the will of fire. Taking her usual stroll around the village, she stumbled upon a strange sight. A young blonde-haired child was sitting behind trash cans crying. Now normally she wouldn't have noticed this child since he was well hidden in the shadows, but there was a special aura around the boy that drew her to him. It was as if she knew him somehow, like they shared something very close. She was about to go to him, when a large crowd of the villagers came walking down the street. A woman within the crowd heard the small crying and went to try and find the source. Hogasha saw that the child would now be alright, and started to walk away. However as soon as she left, she heard a shrill screeching noise. Whirling around, she stared in horror at seeing the woman slapping the blonde child away. The rest of the crowd glared at the child and pulled out daggers and other weapons. She could only watch painfully as the crowd mercilessly beat the child. There was so much blood. The civilians had stabbed all or their weapons into the young blonde's fleshy body. Nine kanai were jutting out of the child's belly, through his hands and feet pinning him to the wall, while others ruthlessly stabbed him in the legs and torso. She desperately wanted to help the boy, but she was just a spirit without a body of her own. Before anything else could be done, a man wearing an inu mask appeared and dispersed the crowd. The anbu then turned on the child who was staring at him pleadingly and just walked away without helping the child. Hogasha was furious. This boy was being tortured by her village, and not a single soul had tried to help him. Now looking closely at the child, she found what drew her to him. The will of fire burned in him brighter than anyone she had ever met. She then decided to awaken a gift she bestowed to his distantly related ancestors, the Mokaton. Two years later, today was October 9th, the day before the Kyubi festival, and the day before his surrogate grandson's eighth birthday. The Sandame found himself buried in paperwork regarding his surrogate grandson Naruto. The entirety of the civilian council wanted him to be executed, while the Shinobi council did not care either way. The one thing he had to look out for was his old teammate Danzo, and his wanting Naruto to be used as a weapon of mass destruction. Oh Minato. I'm sure you and Kashina are rolling in your graves furious at how the village has treated your son. He was running through the alleys trying to dodge the crowds that always seemed to find him. Every year, it was the same. October was the month that the village declared the fox hunt. The villagers would hunt him down and try to cause him pain. However this month he had yet to be caught, and was able to dodge all of the attempts. His running brought him to a large fenced off forest. Now he didn't know why the forest was fenced off, but he figured nobody would look for him there. Jumping up he scaled the fence and darted off into the forest. A local chunin spotted him running in the forest and thought to himself, him good, the demon will be killed in that forest, and nobody can save him. The Chunin walked away pretending like he hadn't seen anything at all. The forest was dark and dreary. Everything seemed to lash out at him. Tree branches would dart out at him, while other plants would try and wrap around him. It was so cold, he had nothing warm, as he came unprepared for the forest. Although he didn't have anything anyways, the villagers made sure of that every time they attacked him. Naruto turned around wanting to go back home, but he couldn't find his way. He started running around, but it seemed as though he was only running in circles. All the trees looked the same. The plants were all different though. Suddenly he stumbled upon a small cave covered by the dark green foliage of the forest. As he got closer to the cave, an earth-shaking roar blasted him away from the entrance and into a tree. The force of the blast knocked him out momentarily as a tiger the size of an elephant came out. The tiger carefully walked over to Naruto and was about to kill him, when the oak branches of the tree wrapped around the boy in a safe cocoon. 
So this is one of his kin. The tiger thought. The tiger gently nuzzled the branches to show he remembered and waited as the branches receded. He picked up the boy with his teeth and carried him back inside the cave to rest. Hokage's office. What do you mean he's missing? Sarutobi yelled at the Kuma Anbu member. He was beyond furious. There was no way that Naruto could have evaded his ninja, let alone his Anbu. They were trained to find his chakra signature, and since Naruto couldn't mask his chakra, he should have been found easily. The only way to avoid detection was if he left the village, was kidnapped by another village, or if he was killed. He couldn't think of his grandson being dead. It was an impossibility. Sir Weave looked everywhere, the orphanage, Ichirakus, and every alleyway in the village. We have either declare him dead, or missing. And I think you know what that means sir. Sarutobi paled at that. If he even hinted that Naruto may be missing, then the council would surely override any decision he made, and make him into a missing nin. Fine. Call the council for an emergency council meeting immediately. Kuma vanished in the common leaf shushin. Sarutobi was left with a massive headache, and in a mood of absolute desolation. Homura Maitokado, one of the village elders asked. What is the meaning of this meeting Serutobi-sama? Serutobi looked out at all the council members, Hayuga Hiyashi, Nara Shikaku, Akamichi Choza, Uchiha Fugaku, Inazuka Sum, Yamanaka Inoichi, Abarame Shibi, Shimura Danzo, and Udatane Kaharu. Sighing he stated, Uzumaki Naruto is the reason for this council meeting. At this the entirety of the civilian council jumped to their feet and started barking out curses and other obscenities. Quiet. Serutobi yelled. Naruto has done nothing at all and yet you hate him and curse him for saving all of your lives. He contains as in holds back the Kyubi's wrath, and you still want him dead. Well as of now your wish has regretfully been fulfilled. Once again the council went crazy. While the civilian side was rejoicing and being happy, the shinobi council varied from having smirks on their face to having fearful and sorrowful expressions. Danzo then asked, How exactly do we know the validity of your statement? Serutobi glared at Danzo while tears were running down his face. This destroyed any thought that this might have been a lie. The Sandame cared so much for the boy that it was obvious he was hurting. The council then left in silence out of respect for the Sandame. As he was leaving, Danzo thought, damn. Now the demon brat will never be under my control. In the forest of death. Naruto just woke up. Ow. He said rubbing the back of his head. Where am I? He looked around only to see darkness all around except for a small barely visible light off in the distance. You are safe little one. A voice echoed. Frantically looking around, he asked. Where are you? Who are you? He started to back up against what he believed was the cave wall and raised his arms to cover his face. There's nothing to fear little one. I won't hurt you. The voice echoed again. This time a trail of fire flew along the roof of the cave giving light to the once dark. Naruto looked on and saw a magnificent orange and black tiger. My name little one is Shinwa. Although you may call me Shin if you wish. Shin lied down to show he wasn't going to harm him. Naruto carefully walked over and started to pet him. How come you can talk? I didn't know animals could talk. Shin backed away a few feet and pulled out a large scroll. The reason is because I am a summon animal from the tiger clan, and I should like you to become my clan's new summoner. The large scroll in front of him unraveled and showed one man's name and fingerprint. Who's Hashirama Senju? And why would you want me to be your summoner? Naruto asked slowly looking down. He was thinking about how everyone always called him a monster, and wouldn't play with him. Shin saw the sad look on Naruto's face a silently growled. Hashirama would be furious at how his village treats this child. Shin walked over and nuzzled his nose into Naruto. I want you as my clan's summoner because you have gone through so much that no child should go through. You also have the blood of my previous summoner. How I'm not sure as I do not know you name, but since you do not know the name Senju then I do not believe you are a Senju. Tell me boy what is your name? Naruto looked up into Shin's eyes and happily proclaimed. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, future Godam Hokage. An Uzumaki eh? Well then I think we'll get along just fine. Alright Naruto. I just need you to sign this scroll with your blood, and you will be able to summon the tiger clan. The one exception of this is that you must not tell anyone about this contract. I can't tell Hokage Gigi. Naruto asked a little upset. No you can't tell the Hokage about me at all. If he were to know, then he would be forced to expose my contract as a Konoha contract, 
and I do not want that. I understand. Do you know the way out of this forest? I'd like to go home. Naruto mumbled. Shin looked at him worriedly. Where is it you live? In a nice little cardboard box hidden in an alley on the far east side of the village. Why? Naruto asked Ing his head to the side. Oh yes these villagers will pay for their crimes against this child. All right kid. Since you want to be Hokage someday I'll start teaching you how to be a shinobi. Now my clan is more focused on strength and agility, so that's what we're going to work on first. Follow me. Shin walked out of the cave and waited for Naruto to come out. Now then the place we're going is pretty far, so get on my back. Naruto climbed on his back and grabbed a fistful of Shin's fur so he wouldn't fall off. Like a strike of lightning, Shin shot off. Naruto screamed out of joy as he felt like he was traveling at the speed of light. Within mere seconds, they were at a clearing with a small lake in the middle being fed by a nearby river. Little sunlight filtered down to the forest floor as the trees made a canopy above the ground. He wished there was more sunlight, and surprisingly the canopy retreated back allowing a great beam of light to shine on the forest floor. Naruto jumped off Shin's back and immediately jumped into the lake. Of course he started splashing around randomly going so far to even splash Shin with water. Shin backed away out of Naruto's splash range and just took a nap until Naruto would finish playing. He didn't however take into account Naruto's incredible stamina, and so he didn't tire out until dark. Naruto then walked over and fell asleep against Shin's side snoring loudly. I guess we can start training tomorrow then. The next day, Shin woke Naruto up early and stretched. Looking at Naruto's still sleepy form, he decided to have a little fun. He grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and tossed him into the lake. The effect was instantaneous. Naruto started screaming profanities and splashing around in the water. Why would you do that? Naruto yelled. Shin just laughed and said, it was to wake you up. And I think it did the job. Shin smiled and then proceeded to drag Naruto out of the lake. Now since you're all awake, let's start with your physical training. For your warm up, run around the lake five times, then do 20 push ups and 20 sit ups. Now you'll be doing this exercise every day for a week until you can do all of this without getting winded. After you finish, you're going to meditate and find your chakra. Naruto finished his early morning exercise rather fast, and got started on trying to find his chakra. He sat still, which was quite hard for the boy, and felt a great warmth flow through his body. Suddenly blue chakra exploded out of his body and dissipated into the air and being absorbed by the plants around him. Now he didn't feel the warmth, but a fire in his gut. He screamed out in agony and fell into sweet unconsciousness. Naruto woke up in front of a large cage. Peering inside, he saw the sleeping from of a small orange-red fox. Not thinking anything was wrong, he walked in the cage and started to pet the little fox. Surprisingly the fox started to purr, almost like a cat, but in a deeper tone. The fox then opened one red eye and stared at the child petting her. What are you doing? The fox asked. Naruto recoiling in shock stared at the now awake fox. I was petting you. Was that wrong? he asked innocently. The fox then shook its head. Tell me what your name is. Naruto. Naruto Uzumaki. The fox then stared eyes widening. So this is her kit. The odds of me being sealed into three Uzumakis. But what is this I sense in him? Well then. I guess you should know my name. It is Aiko, the Kayubi no Kitsune. Naruto stepped back in shock, but then seeing the look in Aiko's eyes, walked towards her. He pulled her into his lap and resumed petting her. Aiko just sat and enjoyed the feeling. So Naruto, how would you like to have bloodline? Looking confused, Naruto asked, what bloodline? Well it would be a variant of the Sharingan. Since I was the one who gifted it to those arrogant bastard Uchihas, I should be able to give it to you nay. Of course I'd have to alter your DNA just a little bit, and you would have to rip away half of the seal, she starts to whisper at the end. Not yet at least. I don't want to be overwhelmed, I mean I did just meet my new family. Naruto gets up to leave, then realizes he doesn't know how. Um would you mind telling me how to get out of wherever here is? Sighing Aiko just nods. Just concentrate on being in the real world, and you'll leave. The same goes for coming back here. Goodbye Naruto. With Shin, Shin was pacing back and forth in front of Naruto's small body. He was extremely nervous for the boy. He felt a tad bit of yukai, and then watched as the boy blacked out. He must be the Nine Tails Jinchuriki, he thought to himself. 
but why didn't I sense the beast when I first saw him? I'm used to the smell of Yukai as Mito was Hashirama's wife and she was also a Jinchuriki. He picked up Naruto and dipped him in the water in an effort to wake him up. It had no effect whatsoever. Just as he was about to give up and go to sleep, he watched as Naruto slowly pushed himself up. Running up to the boy, he started babbling. Naruto are you alright? You're not hurt are you? No? Okay good. What happened did you meet the Kyubi what did it say? No Shin I'm fine. I did meet Aiko, and she did offer me some bloodline called the Sharingan. But I don't know what that is so I declined for now. Shin started to think on what this could mean. The Kyubi has to know he already has the Mokaton which can control it, so why does it want to give it the Sharingan which also can be used to control it, what did he say she? Shin was brought out of his stupor when Naruto started bouncing around. Hey Shin hey Shin hey Shin. Look at what I can do, in a split second Naruto seemingly vanished. Shin stared in amazement. Holy shit what did that brat just do? He's not that fast yet. He looked all around and still couldn't find the blonde brat anywhere until some branch hit him. He looked up to see where the stick came from, and to his amazement, he saw Naruto sitting on top of a branch about a hundred feet up. Isn't this so cool? Naruto exclaimed. Shin just looked flabbergasted. Naruto had perfected a technique created by Hashirama. While Hashirama could travel through wood, Naruto just traveled through the grass. Hum his Mokaton might be more powerful than Hashirama-sama's. Naruto then melted into the wood and appeared behind Shin jumping on him. So what do you think? Cool right. He had just finished swimming in the nearby lake when he went to dry off when he heard it. Get off my face you asshole. He heard something mumble from the ground. He immediately jumped back in surprise. Hey. Now you're stepping on me. Get off. Another voice said. What the are you doing? Stop stepping on me. This went on for about 20 minutes. He was constantly jumping up and down until he finally just jumped back into the lake near shore. Peering out of the water, he silently whispered, Where are you? He was then surprised to hear a multitude of voices. We're right in front of you. We're the grass you Nimrod. We are surprised that you're actually talking back to us like you can hear us somehow. Can you hear us? At first he didn't know what to think. Maybe this was a part of that Mokaton bloodline thingy. Um well yeah I can hear you. I have this Mokaton bloodline thing, so maybe that's what is allowing me to talk to you guys. The grass that surrounded the lake started to rumble and sway, even though there was no wind at all. After a moment of silence, the forest erupted into jubilation. Somebody can hear us. Oh this is so cool. Hey Chin did ya hear? There's a human who understands us. Oh this is so awesomey. Naruto sweat dropped at all of the plants talking among themselves. Guys, he shouted. The plants still continued to ignore him favoring talking to themselves about him. Guys shutup. I can't even hear myself think. All noise around him stopped entirely. Well that was pretty cool. So how do I get out without hurting any of you guys? He was answered by silence until a young voice shouted up from the blades of grass. Oh oh how about you fly? Before Naruto could answer, he heard a much older sounding voice shout up from the grass. Stupid youngling, humans can't fly. The young voice spoke up again. Oh yeah. Well how come this one can talk to us old timer? The older blade of grass didn't say anything. Hum that's what I thought. So can you fly? Naruto, who was quite amused by the grass had totally spaced out. Huh. Oh right. Um no I can't fly. Does it really hurt if I step on you? The clearing all shouted up in one chorus, not really, it's just annoying. Oh alright then. Well I'm gonna go now. I'll be sure to come back and talk sometime. With that said, Naruto sped off back towards the cave trying to take the least amount of steps possible. End flashback. Naruto was brought out of his thoughts, when Cairo, the first tree he made friends with wanted to talk to him. What's up Cha-chan? Hi Naruto, I just wanted to know if you had completed that chakra control exercise. Naruto just smiled and started to walk up her tree. Naruto ha ha that tickles. He laughed and plopped down and leaned up against her. So do you have anything that you'd like to teach me? No, not at the moment, however I believe Shin might teach you something today. Naruto was just about to ask her what else she knew, when he saw Shin drowsily came out of the cave. Smirking, Naruto decided to get revenge. He sat down in meditation and felt through the air for what he was looking for. The area above Shin was now not just air, but it was a large swirling mass of water. 
it had to have held at least 20 gallons of water. When Shin opened his eyes, he saw Naruto sighting under a tree with his eyes closed. He squinted over in Naruto's direction. Whenever Naruto actually willingly meditated, there was usually something bad about to happen to him. He wondered what it would be today. Vines that dragged him into the ground, some sort of pinecone bomb perhaps. He was thoroughly caught unaware when a ton of ice cold water fell over him, soaking him to the bone. He looked over at Naruto who was grinning like a madman, and could only growl at the kid. Hummin to think I was going to help train you. It seems like you're doing just fine on your own right now. He was surprised though. He hadn't taught the boy anything at all, and yet he was able to somehow manipulate water just like Hashirama's brother Tobarama. Naruto stared at Shin, all foolishness aside. His small harmless prank could have postponed his awesome training. He quickly went back into meditation and tried his hardest to pull the water off of Shin's fur. This however would not work. Shin who was still wet, could only smile at the boy. Like a dog, he shook all the water out of his fur. He did want to know of course how Naruto was able to do this, and so he started his game of 20 questions. Naruto, how did you do that anyway? I've never seen such skill in a child so young. Naruto chuckled and buried himself in Shin's fur. I don't know, I can only do it when I concentrate a really hard. If I don't concentrate hard enough, nothing happens at all. But my new friends told me a lot about being a ninja, and they taught me these really cool chakra exercises. See. He then proceeded to walk up and down a tree five or six times. I also kinda expanded on that, so now instead of stepping on grass, I use my chakra to walk on top of the grass. That way the grass won't get annoyed, and I don't make footprints in the ground, so I wouldn't need to cover my tracks to avoid detection if I was on some kind of cool stealthy mission. Shin's jaw dropped to the ground. At first he was amazed that Naruto could actually do the tree walking exercise. But he was also confused at these so-called friends that Naruto had. From what he thought was that he was Naruto's only friend. And the only possibility of Naruto making another friend was either that psychotic purple-haired Kunoichi who he would see come into the forest from time to time came and talked to him, or he met another clan member. The last part was highly unlikely because he was the only one from the tiger clan that lived in the human world. The rest of his family lived in the summoning realm near the monkey clan. Of course he may have summoned one of them without my knowing. So who is this friend that you have made? Well um you see about that. I don't really know how. Maybe it's cuz of the Mokaton thing. But I can talk to plants. I've made a few friends with the trees, and the grass that's near the lake on the north side. They're really funny. Although they don't really teach me anything, it's fun to just talk to them. The trees though. They're awesome. They taught me how to do that tree walking technique thing because well they're trees, and UHHM they just know about it because people have walked up them sometimes I guess. Naruto chuckled with his hand scratching the back of his head. This really is a new type of Mokaton. Hashirama-san wasn't able to talk to plants like Naruto can. Shin just shook his head as he looked at Naruto. To tell the truth I was going to teach you how to do the tree walking exercise, but since you already know it, I guess I don't need to. So instead I'll teach you the water walking exercise. Naruto looked at Shin in amazement, he never knew you could walk on water. Of course he hadn't known you could walk up trees either, but that was different. Now then water walking exercise is similar to your grass walking exercise in a way I believe. What you do, is send your chakra to your entire foot and keep it completely still. By keeping your chakra still, you aren't moving the water at all, thus not breaking the surface tension. If you do break the surface tension, then you'll fall in the water. It's as simple as that. So I trust you can figure the rest out on your own. I'm gonna go take a nap. Shin left a sweat dropping Naruto to his own devices and actually did go take a nap. Naruto, picking himself up from the ground, ran over to the lake. He started out slow at first, he went to the shallowest region right by the shore, where if he stepped in the water, only his foot would be underwater. The first few attempts ended up in failure. On his tenth try however, he was able to successfully stand on the water. When he took a step towards the deeper water, he fell into the water. So it seems like the deeper the water gets, the more chakra I have to put into my feet. Once again he started out on the shore and slowly walked out into deeper waters. As he was reaching the point where he fell last time, he pumped a little more chakra into his feet. Unfortunately when he did this, he skyrocketed into a tree. The only thing that saved him from hurting his back, was a few brotches from the tree caught him just before he hit the tree itself. 
He muttered a quick thank you and went back to trying to master the water walking exercise. Each time he went out, he was able to go out a few more feet, until he was either blasted into another tree where he was caught by the branches, or he fell into the cold water. After about two hours of doing this, he started to feel a little tired, deciding that he didn't wanted to risk falling asleep outside in the open where he could possibly get eaten he went back to the cave that he and shin lived in shin had told him not to stay outside the cave after it got dark because that was when most of the nastier creatures of the forest came out now he didn't want to go against shin at all since he was his best friend and so he just slept in the cave the next morning waking up early naruto went outside to go pick some herbs and berries to eat for breakfast at first he felt kind of bad because he thought he was killing the plant, but then the plants usually told him that it wouldn't die just because he picked a few leaves and berries. They were expendable things for the plant. The greatest thing was that the plants told him if they were poisonous so he didn't have to worry about eating anything bad. After he ate his full in berries and herbs, he set back out to the lake, determined to finally master the water walking exercise. He did this for about an hour till he could successfully say he was proficient with the exercise since he was at the middle of the lake and he hadn't fallen in or been blasted off. He knew however he was far from mastering the exercise. For the next two hours all he did was run on the surface of the lake. This not only increased his chakra control, but it also increased his endurance so he could run even longer. Of course when he still lived in Konoha, well technically he still lived in Konoha, just not in the village itself. But anyway when he lived in Konoha, he was able to outlast running away from ninja in the village. They were old, so he assumed they must have been junins at least. Every time he had run from the angry ninjas sometimes other ninjas with masks would chase after him. He always thought their masks were funny. I mean why wear a mask that looks like a little rat, or a dog, it seemed stupid to him. There were only two ninja mask people who were always able to catch him. There wore masks that looked like a Hyo, Panther, and Nako cat this he seemed was fine because both animals that they represented were supposed to be very fast he had never seen a hio before though but he had seen plenty of nekos since he had finished his water walking exercise he decided to go and explore the surrounding forest during the entire year he had lived in the forest he had never actually ventured away from the cave and the lake clearing he found that today he was just curious about what else was in the forest and so he went to find out Truly everything seemed the same as where he lived. The trees looked the same, there were however different plants. A lot of different plants in the area. For what seemed like hours he was just talking to the different plants, asking what they were, if their leaves were edible and any other question he could think of. When he got over to a small matsu, pine, tree, he noticed a small glob of blood that was on the bark of the tree. Could you please clean this blood off my bark? It is really irritating me, the matsu tree requested. Naruto used sat down and meditated. Within 10 minutes, he pulled some water out of the air and cleaned the blood off the tree. Touching the bark of the tree he asked. Whose blood is this? Is something hurt? Yes I believe so. I saw this purple haired woman come stumbling by here not long ago. She leaned up against me to regain her breath I think. It must have been then that her blood got on me. If you want to know, she went in the direction the Sakura tree over there is. Thank you again for cleaning off the blood. Naruto nodded and thanked the tree for its help. He went off in the direction of where the tree had told him to go. He had to ask each tree and bush that had some blood on it where the kunoichi went, but it was worth it. Walking for what seemed like a mile he finally saw the body of the purple-haired kunoichi. She was laying face down on the ground and seemed to be bleeding profusely. He dashed over to her and turned her over onto her back. She had a large gash down her right thigh. Now he didn't know a lot, well any really medical jutsu so he tried to staunch the bleeding by ripping off the sleeve of his jacket and tying extremely tight above the wound looking around the clearing he saw a small plant that he knew was good for healing small cuts if it was ground up with care and precision after he applied the crushed up herbs to the area of the wound he tore off his other sleeve and wrapped it around the wound to at least try and close it he felt now would be the best time to actually try and summon a tiger going through the hand signs boar dog bird monkey ram kuchiyose no jutsu a fairly large tiger appeared out of a puff of smoke he was easily 10 feet tall looking around the tiger's gaze fell on naruto standing over a woman naruto san it is a pleasure to be your first summon my name is hayei what is it that you require of me 
Naruto smiled at the tiger and gestured towards the woman. This Kunoichi here is hurt. I tried to help the best I could, but I would feel better if she were taken to a hospital. There is a village not far to the west of here. Please take her to one of the gates and drop her on the other side. It's not much, but she will be inside the village, and someone will surely find her. Oh and please don't go back home until you're back in the forest well hidden by trees. Shin doesn't want the tiger clan to be known as a summoning clan. Hayai nodded at Naruto's request. Naruto then picked up the woman and gently placed her on Hayai's back where he sprinted off towards the direction Naruto pointed in. Once Hayai reached a gate for the affrest, he jumped over it. A couple chunin that were patrolling the area shit their pants at the sight of a large tiger jumping over the huge gate. They were about to attack the tiger when they saw it drop a body at the gate. The tiger then proceeded to jump back over the gate and ran off into the forest. One of the chunins broke the silence. What the was that? Another chunin pointed over at the purple-haired Kunoichi and said, Hey is she dead? They all rushed over to her, and saw that she did have some rough bandages wrapped around her leg. It was odd the wrappings were orange and black, when she didn't have anything orange. It would seem that someone else was inside the forest. Hey wait I recognize her. She's Anko Mitarashi, the crazy snake chick? Yeah. Seems her favorite play place has finally decided to take some revenge. One of the chunins said, Anyways, let's get her to the hospital. Even if I don't really like her, she shouldn't die because of some stupid forest. We should also go report this to Hokage sama. Two of the chunins carried Anko towards the hospital while the other two resumed their patrol. Hayai watched the chunins take care of Anko, and then left to go back to the summon realm in a puff of smoke. Now she was lying in a hospital bed recovering from her stupidity. As she was about to go to sleep, she saw the Hokage walk in the room. She immediately sat up and nodded at him. Serutobi nodded back and asked, Are you feeling all right Anko? I'll feel a lot better soon. But right now I'm all right. She noticed Serutobi nod while he had a small smile on his face. She was confused why he was smiling though. Hokage-sama. Why are you smiling? Are you glad I'm hurt? Serutobi shook his head while chuckling. No, not at all Anko. But because of your injuries I now know something isn't true. When you arrived at the hospital you had a piece of cloth wrapped around your leg. According to Sum, the scent that was on the cloth belongs to someone we believed was dead. Anko looked confused. Whose cloth is it? Serutobi looked at her sternly. What I'm about to tell you is an S-rank secret. Her eyes lit up immediately. For this to be such a large secret, it had to be someone who was very important. I understand Hokage-sama. Good. The scent belongs to Uzumaki Naruto the Jinchuriki of the Kayubi no Kitsune. Just a year ago I declared him dead as he went missing one day and we couldn't find him for a month. Now with you gaining your injuries within the forest of death, and the cloth you received. That leads to the assumption that Naruto is still alive and living in the forest of death. Anko lost her breath. She remember the Uzumaki kid, he always brightened a lot of the ninja's day. Of course he only brightened up those that didn't think he was the Kayubi. She remembered all of the pranks that he used to do and how he would outrun a lot of the chunins. Now I don't know how you feel about Naruto, but considering you're the only one besides Sum and I who know about this. If you reveal this to anyone I will kill you. Do I make myself clear? Anko dumbly nodded. Never had she seen the Hokage so serious about anything. Good. Rest up for a few days, but don't get too comfy I'll have a mission for you when you get out of the hospital. Serutobi walked out of the room and she was alone in her little hospital room. She lay back on her pillow and tried to go to sleep even with all this information running around him in her mind. It was late at night, and once again he was doing paperwork. He finally finished the stack of paperwork after 20 minutes when he noticed another pile at the edge of his desk. Kami no. Deciding he'd finish it in the morning, he went to home and went to sleep since the paperwork was too troublesome. Dream world. Mindscape. He'd had this dream many times over. It was when he was younger, before he became Hokage. When he was the student of Hashirama and Tobarama Senju. However this time the dream was different. He wasn't his usual child self, he was the same age he was now. Also Minato was standing next to Tobarama and Hashirama with some green-haired woman. They all had frowns on their face. Before he could even speak, he saw a yellow flash and felt a searing pain in his stomach. He was blasted up into the sky where Minato once again used the Hiraishin and slammed a Rasengan into his stomach sending him spiraling into the ground. 
When he opened his eyes he looked out of the seven-foot crater he was in and stared at Minato glaring at you. He could only watch as Minato lifted him up by the collar and stared daggers at him. Why are you so weak? Minato said then spat in his face. You've lost your spine old man. The will of fire has already died in you. Serutobi tried to kick Minato, but got kneed in the stomach by him. You did nothing to help my son while he was in the village. I trusted you old man, and you let me down. You are no longer considered my friend anymore Serutobi. He started to release a few tears. My last request while I was alive was to have my son known as a hero not a demon that needs to be eradicated. You and this village have stomped on my legacy and I am disappointed in everyone. Minato kun I did everything I could to help Naruto. Serutobi tried to explain. No you did nothing to help my son. You are no longer the wise man that I once admired. You are like the scum of the world. You see everything happen and yet do nothing to stop it. Minato said and threw Serutobi into the ground while he went to stand back with Hashirama. Standing at the edge of the crater he was in stood Tobarama and Hashirama. I'm disappointed in you monkey. You truly have lost your will of fire. To allow such things to happen to a child is shocking. Especially to allow that to happen to a hero child, Hashirama said. I truly have to wonder if the village had known my wife Mito was the Kyubi's first Jinchuriki would she have been hated. Serutobi looked aghast. Everyone in the village had loved Mito. The people could never hate her. He started to speak but Tobarama cut him off. You are not the Hirazan Serutobi that I taught. You've lost control of the entire village. You allow the civilian council to walk all over you and you do nothing about it. Konoha is a military dictatorship. Your word is law and yet your own ninja disregard your laws. I may have been drunk the night I decided to establish the civilian council, but they are only supposed to deal with the civilian aspects of the village. They have no say at all in the dealings of shinobi. Each word uttered was like a knife to the heart, and each one more painful than the last. Were he not lying in the crater, he'd have collapsed long ago. Tears were running down his cheeks as he looked into Minato's hurt-filled eyes. He finally choked out. What can I do? This time Hashirama blew up on him. Do your ing job. Become the Kami no Shinobi once again who could turn the tide of any battle at just the mention of your name. Rekindle your will of fire and take back our village. Serutobi nodded and looked back at them, and after wiping the tears from his face he had a fire in his eyes that had not been seen for many years. Behind the circle of Hokages, Hogasha smiled at them. With a snap of her fingers, Hashirama, Tobarama, and Minato vanished in smoke. Serutobi looked around trying to find them again when his eyes fell upon the green-haired woman. Who are you? He asked. Hogasha smiled and looked at him. My name is Hogasha and I am the spirit of Konoha, or as you would know. I am the will of fire. Serutobi didn't look quite convinced, but let her continue. I was the one who allowed you to speak to your predecessors and your deceased successor. Konoha needs the Kami no Shinobi again, or she will fall. You must become strong again here as in Serutobi. Now I know you want to send young Midarashi to find Naruto-kun, but I recommend you don't. It will only be a waste of time. Serutobi became silent very fast at that. He was leaking key that could rival that of a Bijus. How do you know about that? Hogasha laughed. I already told you Hirazan. I am the spirit of Konoha, and I have taken an interest in Naruto unlike you. Serutobi glared at her. Oh don't give me that Hirazan, now only at the end do you finally try and protect Naruto. He has the brightest flame I have ever seen in Konoha. Even after everything that has happened to him, it hasn't driven him insane yet, and I am thoroughly surprised at that. Unfortunately Naruto Uzumaki has died. When she said this Serutobi's key spiked even greater than the Kyubis and actually caused her to take a step back. Clenching his fist he growled out. What did you do to him? Naruto is still alive, however Naruto Uzumaki as you proclaimed is dead. Naruto Senju is alive. As soon as I speak with him that is, he will be a Senju. I blessed the Senju clan and I have done this to Naruto as well. So he could be a Senju in that regard. However if he wishes to go by his father's name he may. You can't tell him that. Serutobi told her. Like hell I can't. He already knows of the Kyubi, and besides he has a right to know who his parents were. Serutobi tried to argue with her, but came up with nothing. Goodbye Hirazan, we'll be in touch sooner or later. I'll be looking forward to your return to power. Real world. He woke up drenched in sweat and could feel a small amount of blood on his. In the coming hours to morning, Konoha would be changed forever.
Morning. The civilian and shinobi council had all gathered in the council chambers and were waiting for Serutobi to arrive. Within five minutes Serutobi walked in the room in his cage robes smoking his black wood pipe. One of the civilian council members asked. Why have you called us here? Serutobi's key filled the room and the civilians started to sweat. I called you here and that is it. You come when I call and if you don't you will be kicked from this council. The civilian closed his quickly and looked down at the floor. Taking a puff of his pipe, Serutobi started again. Now then the civilian council will leave the council room. We have shinobi business to discuss. One Mio Haruno stood up and screeched. You cannot do that the civilian council has been here since the time of the Nidame. Serutobi glared at her. The civilian council deals with civilian matters like our trading. You have no idea what the life of a shinobi entails so you have no say at all in shinobi business. Now get thee out of here before I decide to have my Anbu escort you all to Ibiki for insubordination. The civilians even though not ninjas, knew of Ibiki and all rushed out the room as quick as they could. Sum Inazuka smirked. So the Kami no Shinobi has come out of retirement. It's about time. Serutobi looked at Sum and smiled. Let's just say I have had a revelation of sorts and decided to get back to my old self. He then turned over to Danzo who was sitting next to Kaharu and Homura. Danzo when your root nin returns from Kumo would you please inform me as quickly as possible? Danzo looked absolutely shocked. There was no way the old fool could have known about that mission he ordered. He shouldn't have even known Root was still active. Yes Danzo I have known all along you never disbanded Root even when I told you to, but I just overlooked it. Now however I want you to fully reactivate your Root program. Danzo looked at him quizzically. That will take time and cost money, what is the budget that you are giving me? Oh I assume the 5 million Rio you have been siphoning off of our village funds for the past 10 years will be more than enough. Danzo paled, he was hoping Serutobi didn't know about that. The only thing I require for the reactivation of Root is that you inform me of everything you do. All missions you send my shinobi on must go through me for approval. The missions that your Root in will go on will be high A to high S rank missions. You will also have to stop using your curse seal on your ninja and every nin you have must have the curse seal removed from the back of their tongue. This was greater than Danzo could have imagined possible. He would be able to keep his control over Nei, even though he had to go through Serutobi for everything. It will be done Hokage-sama, and Arigato. Nara Shikaku was wondering why Serutobi was doing all of this. He decided not to ask though, it was all so troublesome. The next thing Serutobi said really shocked the council. Fugaku I have to inform you the Uchiha are now disbanded from being the main police force of Konoha. Fugaku stood up immediately and shouted at Serutobi. The Uchiha have been Konoha's police force since the founding of the village. You cannot disband us. Serutobi just shook his head. Fugaku the reason I'm disbanding the Uchiha police force is not because I believe you to be incompetent. It's because I have other plans for the Uchiha. Some Uchiha may stay with the police force and you may stay in command of the police force, but I also want the Hyuga, Inazuka, and Abarame to help with the force. Hiyashi Hyuga nodded. The Hyuga family can do that. We will have some of our branch members go into the police force. I assume this is because our Byakugan can see through walls. Yes Hiyashi that is one of the reasons. Now Sum, Shibi do you agree to allow members of your clan part of the police force? Even though I can order you to. I would like for you to agree. Serutobi asked. Shibi and Sum both nodded. It was a fine idea. Good now the men and women you choose to go into the police force will not stay there permanently. Each clan will switch out members every three months. That way no one will get lazy and not train for missions. Also the police force can offer a break for your family members after constant missions all the time. Fugaku the reason I am splitting the police force with many different clans is because the Uchiha have not been doing many missions. It has been a long time since we have had any Uchiha as a Junin sensei or a platoon of Uchiha Chunin. Your clan has become too arrogant and lazier than the Nara clan men. You all believe the Sharingan makes you gods, but it is only a tool. Your clansmen are only allowed to copy techniques from people if you gain their permission first. It is not fair to those who have spent blood sweat and tears working to create these jutsus just for you to come in and copy them. On the battlefield if you fight an enemy shinobi please copy the jutsu that way we can share it with the entire village. Are you alright with this Fugaku? Fugaku stayed silent for a good few minutes debating in his mind. 
This would give the Uchiha a more active role in the village, and allow them to elevate the glory of the clan. To tell the truth he had thought his clan had gotten lazy. He had seen how whenever they copied a jutsu it was always significantly weaker than others. He couldn't even remember the last time he had seen one of his clansmen train. Save for his son Itachi, no Uchiha ever did anything but use their Sharingan. I feel like this is the best course of action and I thoroughly agree Hokage-sama. It may take time to convince the Uchiha elders of this though. Serutobi smiled, that is fine Fugaku, as soon as you get that sorted out with your clan report back to me. He then turned to Shikaku. Now then Shikaku I want you to start planning new patrol routes, a completely new code system, and evacuation routes. And why would we need to do this Hokage-sama? Shikaku asked politely. Because Shikaku Konoha has become too lax and has become arrogant. We have emerged victorious and on top in all three great shinobi wars, and in this time of peace we have become lazy. The Kayubi attack should have opened our eyes about our laziness but it did not. Serutobi stopped for a moment to gather his breath and let the information sink in. Now I am having Tsunade return to the village to do her part for the village. Jiraiya has been doing his job magnificently so he does not have to return, however Tsunade has not been doing her job. It is time I finally put my foot down and make her return. Kaharu. Homura do we have enough funds to establish a medical ninja program? Serutobi asked. Kaharu and Homura looked at each other and pulled out ten scrolls. Now while they're finding that out for me, does anyone have any questions? Nobody said anything. Truly they liked this more forceful Serutobi than the kind one. Konoha would be better off with all of these changes and they loved it. Good. I want all of you back here in two weeks after everything has been assembled and ready. Dismissed. The council then left the room save for Homura and Kaharu who were still going through the village financial records. Ten minutes later, Homura looked up and told Serutobi. We have plenty of Ryo to support a medic nin program and even to bolster our current medical facilities. Kaharu had stopped looking at the scrolls and asked Serutobi. How do you plan on bringing Tsunade-san back to the village? She has already declared she will never return back to the village after what she lost here. Tsunade Chan is a shinobi of Konoha. Many of our ninja have lost family and friends on missions and they have gotten over it. For too long have I let Tsunade wallow in her own grief. She will either return to Konoha or I will be forced to make her into a new nin. Hopefully Jiraiya or my Anbu will find her and bring her back before I am forced to do that though. If she has not been found within five years I will send the hunter Nin after her and force her back to the village. If they can't restrain her in time however I will give the team sent after her a scroll of some information on a surviving relative. Kaharu and Homura's eyes widened. They had believed Tsunade to be the last Senju. To learn that there was another was simply shocking. Who was this person Serutobi? Why have we not been told of this till now? To tell you the truth I had not known myself until last night. He has been living in Konoha for years right under our nose and we never knew. When Serutobi said the Senju was a male, they immediately thought of getting him to repopulate the Senju clan in Konoha. With this mystery man, the Senju would return to Konoha. Who is this Senju and where is he? Serutobi sighed. I am not exactly sure where he is. However I have the inclination to believe he has been living in the forest of death for at least a year. We have to send search parties to find him then, Kaharu said. You still have not told us who this Senju is Serutobi, Homura pointed out. No I have not, and until he returns from the forest of death, I won't tell you his name. This is all we will speak on this matter. I'm going to hopefully finish my paperwork, and then spend time with my grandson. Naruto was playing with two small tiger cubs that he summoned earlier that day. Isamu was the brown tiger with black strips and was about his size. Amy was the smaller yellow tiger who was off to the side trying to catch a butterfly with her paws. They were Hei's cubs and were extremely playful. Well Amy was, Isamu in the middle of exciting and boring. He had also summoned Hayei just so he could talk to him. Hayei was actually really smart, and would tell him everything about the summon world. He had even told him that one day he could come to the summon realm. Hey Hayei. Why does Shin live here and not in the summon world like the rest of you? Well since we haven't had summoner for a long time, nobody has guarded our contract in this realm. So Shinwa took up the duty of holding onto our summoning scroll until a new summoner comes. I would assume when Shinwa believes you are old enough to survive on your own, he will return home to us unless you summon him to come back. Hayei described for Naruto. 
Naruto was about to ask if he could just stay forever, when a green-haired woman appeared in a swirl of leaves. Hai, Isamu, and Amy all noticed this and bowed down immediately. Naruto was confused by this. Who are you? He asked. Hai growled out while bowing. Show some respect this is Ametsuchi, daughter of Seimei the goddess of life. Ametsuchi-sama it is a pleasure to meet you. Hai kun it is nice to meet you as well. It is nice to know my old name is still known to others as well. My name is now Hogasha however, and I am the spirit of Konoha and the will of fire. However I am here to speak with young Naruto-kun here. She turned over to Naruto who had his slightly agape. Hello Naruto-kun, it's good to see you again. But I haven't met you before. I've heard the old man talk about the will of fire before though. He said it was what gave the ninja in the village strength. Naruto said. Yes Naruto-kun the will of fire makes the ninja stronger because it is what drives them to fight for what they love. But no you haven't seen me before Naruto, yet I have seen you. I was the one who blessed you with the ability to use what you call the Mokaton. In actuality I have granted you my power to fully control all plant life. That is why Shinwa believes this is a new form of Mokaton. It is called the Green. With practice and prayer to my mother Seimei you will be able to create plant life from nothing. As long as there is a water source that the plants can draw nutrients upon, they will survive. For instance were you to go into the desert you could create a canopy of trees for a short while until they die of thirst. Hogasha explained. But I don't want to hurt the plants, they're my friends, Naruto said. Hogasha smiled at him. No I don't suppose you would, but you will have to defend yourself in the future. Now Naruto-kun I give you the choice to either take up the mantle of your father's name, or take up the name of my blessed clan the Senju. Naruto stared at her in hope. He had always wanted to know who his parents were. Gigi said he didn't know so that put him down, but now this goddess told him she knew his father. Who were my parents? Your mother was Kashina Uzumaki, Konoha's Red Death. She was an Anbu captain and the wife of the fourth Hokage. When she said his mother he was extremely happy. As soon as she indirectly said who his father was, he opened his in shock. Yes Naruto-kun, your father was Minato Namikaze, the fourth Hokage, the one who sealed the Kyubi within you. She stayed silent after that to see his reaction to this knowledge. At first he wasn't sure how he felt. He was ecstatic to know that his idol was actually his father, but he was saddened to know his father sentenced him to a life of hell. Not knowing what to do, he just stayed quiet, silently watching the ground. Aiko didn't seem like a mean rampaging demon. She was more of a gentle fluffy bunny than a demon. Shin had even told him about the Sharingan that Aiko was so set on giving him. Apparently the Sharingan had the potential to control her, so he was confused as to why she would let him gain the Dujutsu. Now he didn't hate his dad for his early childhood. If he hadn't sealed Aiko in him, he wouldn't have met Shin. Naruto looked up into Hogosh's eyes and declared. I will be stronger than my mother and father and make them proud of me. Hokage's office. Serutobi was currently staring at the bane of his existence. Hoping that if he stared long enough it would go away. Deciding that it would never happen, he begrudgingly started to work on it. Demand to allow civilians back on Shinobi Council, denied. The civilian council had kept trying to force him into letting them have more power, but he would have none of that. Over these two years, he did abide by Hogash's advice and not sent Anko looking for Naruto. However, since she practically lived in there she always searched for him when she didn't have a mission. From what Anko had told him, whenever she went into the forest, she felt like she was being watched. Yet she could never find who or what was watching her. As he was about to start going through the rest of the paperwork, Danzo walked inside. He looked up at Danzo but said nothing as he relit his pipe. Danzo was silent, as if waiting to be addressed. Serutobi took a puff of smoke and then said, What do you need Danzo? Danzo walked up to his desk and put a folder on it. Inside the folder is a list of all the shinobi that work for us, he said rather reluctantly, en route. Serutobi took a minute to peruse the files inside the folder. The folder contained the files of over 200 shinobi. Under each name showed, the person's rank, affinity, proficiency and mission ranks since first enlisting. He was thoroughly impressed with the amount of effort Danzo must have put in this. If I may Hokage-sama, Danzo began. Serutobi gestured for him to continue. I have an S rank mission that needs your approval. Serutobi raised an eyebrow at that. An S rank mission so soon since Root resurfaced. Very well. Let me see what the mission entails. 
Danzo then handed over two more folders, one had the kanji for beginning, and the other had the kanji for end. Serutobi first grabbed hold of the beginning and quickly read it over. The mission was to locate the Senju boy in the forest of death and train him in the forest. He had no qualms with this plan since he wanted Naruto to get stronger. The second folder contained Danzo's request to personally train the boy. This he did not want to happen. Even though he now monitored Danzo's training program, it was still grueling work that only the toughest men and women could survive. Danzo I am perfectly fine with training the Senju while he still lives in the forest. I presume you want this so that the other villages don't target him until he is strong enough to defend himself. Danzo nodded in agreement with a sly smirk on his face. With the last remaining Senju on his side he could mold Konoha into the war machine he always wanted unlike Hiruzen's pansy peace lovers. His train of thought halted when Serutobi spoke. However I am not fine with you training the boy. Not only would people find it odd that you would frequently go into the forest, but also if you did go to train the boy, you would have to relinquish your control of root. Training the boy will be very time consuming and I do not believe you would be able to do both. Donzo's hand twitched ever so slightly, but Serutobi noticed it nonetheless. He knew that training his root operatives was more important to the old war hawk than one apprentice. Then, Danzo began, how do you plan on training the boy since we still do not know where he is? I'm having Anko Mitarashi leave some scrolls inside the forest so that he can find them. Hopefully the boy will find them and be able to train himself with the information. Serutobi said while dumping the ashes from his pipe into the waste bin. Forest of Death, three years later, Naruto now stood 5 foot 11. He had grown out his blonde hair so now on the sides it went down to his chin while still maintaining its spiky quality. He also made sure that it didn't go past his eyebrows lest he have trouble seeing. His whisker marks had also faded into his skin, and he looked exactly like his father when he was 14. Next to him, Isamu lay on the ground staring at the grass. Isamu had grown taller as well, and was now just as tall as Naruto when he stood up. They were currently looking at one of the gates to the forest of death. Naruto looked down at Isamu and nodded. The tiger nodded back and poofed away back to the summon realm. Naruto ran up the side of a tree right next to him and looked over the village. The trees in the forest all overshadowed the village. Hence it was called Konoha, the village hidden in the leaves. From his position at the top of the tree, he could see the Hokage's tower. Smirking, he melted into the tree. Hokage's office. Hiruzen was currently signing off mission reports that had been completed and missions that had yet to be assigned. Just as he was about to read over the plans for the Chunin exams, his fern started to twitch. Looking over at the plant that was next to his couch, he raised his eyebrow. Motioning towards it, one of his anbu went over to check it out. As the anbu got closer to it, he was suddenly trapped by the fern's vines. The vines wrapped around the anbu's legs and arms restricting all movement. The other anbu member unsheathed her katana and started to cut her comrade free. Just as she cut through the first vine, more vines sprung up from the floor and restricted her as well. Then a spiked vine came shooting towards Serutobi. Hiruzen dived to the side narrowly evading the vine. The vine then opened the bottom right-hand drawer of his desk and pulled out a small orange book. Hiruzen however wasn't paying attention. He was busy freeing his anbu. Once they were free, he turned back around to his desk. I always wondered what this book was. I mean seriously I used to catch you reading this when I came to see you unexpected. Hiruzen stared in shock as he looked at a younger looking Minato. He had the same hair and eyes. What cat got your tongue Oji-san? Staring at the blonde Hiruzen smiled. Haha, Naruto my boy how are you? The Anbu behind him stood there emotionless, though the fact that they wore masks helped. Would you please give me my book back? Naruto chuckled and had one of his vines give the book back. Looking at the Anbu he asked, has he ever forgotten you guys were there and read that? Both Anbu looked over at each other and then nodded. Haha that's great. I always thought you were a closet perv Oji-san. I never knew you were so careless that you'd forget they were there. Hiruzen quickly grabbed his book and shoved it in his robes. Yes, yes laugh all you want. So Naruto which residence will you be staying in? I'm sure you know that you are privy to two compounds. You may call your council meeting Oji-san. Namikaze, Senju Naruto is here. Haha <laughs> won't that be a surprise? I can't wait to see the council's reaction. But I will live in both places. That way I can experience both sides of my family equally. And so that they don't just gather dust. 
Serutobi smiled. Turning around to his Anbu he said, Nako would you please escort Naruto here to the Namikaze compound. The Anbu in the Nako mask nodded and bayed for Naruto to follow. Karasu, go and gather the clan heads for a council meeting. Tell them they are not allowed to invite the civilian council as well. I don't want to hear them about why they were kicked out even though it's been a few years. The raven Anbu nodded and disappeared in a shushin. Now alone Serutobi looked at Minato's picture on the wall. You truly have a special son Minato. He then closed his eyes and recalled the past before the Kyubi attack. The happiness that he had with his wife, and the joy that the village had after the third great shinobi war. Those were good days indeed. Council room. When he walked in the room, everyone was already at their places seated talking amongst themselves. Serutobi cleared his throat and the room fell quiet. Soom was the first to speak. What do you need now Hokage-sama, more village reforms? The clan heads chuckled except Fugaku, Hiyashi, and the elders. Well, not entirely. It will cause a drastic change, that's for sure, Serutobi said, with a small grin on his face. Shikaku was just tired. Just tell us so I can go home and take a nap. Serutobi laughed and relented. Very well. The Senju boy that you have come to call has come back into the village. He is now on his way to his father's compound as we speak. Homura was confused. If the boy is a Senju, Tsunade Chan would have to be his mother, so that would be her compound as she is among the last of the Senju and the eldest. Who could this boy's father be to have another compound? The rest of the council was also thinking this. There were no other clan compounds besides their own, and they were sure none of their members had gotten close to Tsunade. Looking over at Hiyashi and Fugaku Hirazan said, The boy's father used to be on Hiyashi and Fugaku's genin team before he was apprenticed. The council had no clue what was going on. They didn't know who was on their genin team. Nor did they really care at that time. But now it was something that needed to be known. Hiyashi and Fugaku's stoic demeanor crashed as they showed immense shock on their faces. Hirazan smiled. Yes. Namikaze Minato is the boy's father and his name is Naruto Namikaze Senju. The council was in more shock than the time Serutobi kicked out the civilian council. Hiyashi and Fugaku were both still trying to wrap their heads around the idea of their best friend having a son. And with Tsunade no less. Kaharu blankly looked at Serutobi. I presume this is why you want Tsunade to return to the village then? Serutobi nodded at her. Fugaku and Hiyashi both stood up and were about to go and leave when Serutobi interrupted them. Where are you two going? This meeting is not over yet. Fugaku did not turn around to address Serutobi. Hiyashi answered for both of them. We're going to meet the child of our best friend. If you would excuse us Hokage-sama. You are not excused. Sit back down we have more to discuss. He waited until the two sat back down. Both of them had a barely noticeable frown on their faces. Now we have to discuss if this news should go public or not. What do you believe? Shibi pushed his sunglasses up his nose. I believe we should keep this information within the village. Serutobi waved his arm for him to carry on. I believe having this information get out right now would prove to be problematic for the village. And how would it be problematic Shibi-san, this is a blessing, Choza said. Because it gives the possibility of war. Many nations do not want the rise of another Kiroi Senko. Especially not a Senju who has the possibility of learning the Hiroishin no Jutsu. Shikaku said actually paying attention to the meeting for once. Whenever there was a council meeting, he would never sleep again. Apparently Serutobi had gone to his wife and told her that he slept during the meetings sometimes. He'd rather go up against the Kyubi than his wife with a frying pan. Remembering the beating she gave him sent shivers down his spine. That is what I believe Shikaku-san. Shibi told Shikaku. But this cannot be kept a secret for long. Eventually his name will get out into the world especially with the Chunin exams coming up. That is why I believe we need to test the boy to determine his skills. It would be unwise to have an Anbu squad guard him all the time. It would take away good shinobi from going on missions. The entire council agreed with him on that point. Very well. I believe Kakashi or Jiraiya would be good to test him. Serutobi suggested. Minato had trained Kakashi, and he was truly a genius when it came to ninjutsu. Of course he had that habit to always be late so that wasn't very good. Jiraiya though had a lot of more experience and had trained Minato in the first place. The problem would be getting Jiraiya over here in time. 
Soom who was quite during the time gave her opinion. Jiraiya-sama would be the better one to test the boy considering his knowledge. He could test the boy in various ways while Kakashi could really only test the boy in ninjutsu. The boy's ninjutsu library is probably very limited considering he has been living in a forest with no one to train him but himself. Very well then. I will call Jiraiya to test the boy. The test will occur in two days. You are dismissed. Serutobi said as he watched everyone get up and supposedly go back home. Fugaku and Hiyashi both walked towards the Namikaze compound that had remained closed since the Kyubi attack. They walked along the 20-foot high wall of the compound until they reached the gate of the compound. From past experience they knew not to try and jump over the wall. Apparently Minato, who was a ceiling genius made a type of barrier that stopped any intruders from entering. The first time someone tried to get through the barrier, they would get a small warning shock. Then if the person tried again, the shock would be more painful and would also paralyze the person for a few seconds. The third time the person tried to get in, the barrier would kill the person by electrocution. The good thing was that the barrier remembered the person's chakra that way if a new person tried to get in, they wouldn't be killed from some other person's foolishness. The gate was still the same as usual, it had never rusted or gotten damaged at all with all of this time. Hiyashi slowly put his hand up to the gate and pushed a tiny bit of his chakra into the keyhole. The gate was then covered in a huge array of seals. Looking at one of the smaller seals to the left of the keyhole he added more of his chakra into it. That one seal glowed a bright yellow color. Speaking into the seal he asked. Namikaze-san, are you there? Now Naruto was currently immersed inside his father's library reading everything that he could find. When he heard a man's voice coming from the gate, he looked out the window. There were two men standing there, obviously waiting for him. He jumped out the window and with the Nako mask Anbu walked towards the two men. When he was close enough to the gate, he asked. How did you make your voice carry like that? Hiyashi however didn't answer. He was too absorbed in remarking how alike this boy was to his best friend. Fugaku was also going over how much the boy looked like Minato. Apparently though, he didn't have a knack for Fuinjutsu. Of course this could be because it was his first time seeing a seal since he lived in the forest of death for years. Fugaku decided to answer Naruto's question. It's a seal that allows for our voice to be projected through the compound to a certain person's position. We only know of this because we were your father's friends before he died. Naruto grinned at them, but still did not let them in. Well I am Namikaze Senju Naruto. It is a pleasure to meet you, and your names are? The black-haired man answered him first. Uchiha Fugaku. Next the white-haired man answered him. And my name is Hayuga Hiyashi. It is a pleasure to meet you as well Namikaze-san. If you would excuse me though, I would like to finish exploring my father's household. Naruto then started to walk back into his house. Before he was too far away, Fugaku shouted out to him. You are expected to be in the council chambers in two days. No doubt Hokage-sama will inform you of this soon, but I just thought you would like to know as soon as possible. Naruto nodded back at them and then disappeared into the house through the front door. It was the day before he had to show his strength to the council to determine his rank. He had fully explored his father's compound and had started reading up on seals. They were truly magnificent tools that used correctly could be devastating. He also started to look in the jutsu library as well. He figured that he would be able to find some things that would prove helpful in his upcoming fight. Of course he did not have enough time to fully explore the library. The part that he was able to find had quite a few scrolls on Genjutsu. Genjutsu, like Fuinjutsu intrigued him. Shin had taught him that sometimes it was better to end a fight quickly instead of drawing it out. If he could cast a Genjutsu on somebody, he could easily incapacitate them before the fight even began. He tried to learn one of the Genjutsus, but he found that he wasn't able. It seemed like his chakra control wasn't up to par for allowing him to cast the Genjutsu. After the Genjutsu section he found himself in a subsection of the Ninjutsu area. The Bunshin section to be exact. He had already learned how to create a Moku Bunshin, but he figured it would be better to know others. He found the Mizu Bunshin, the regular Bunshin which was just an illusion, and the Cage Bunshin. He saw the advantages of the Cage Bunshin, and decided before he went to the Senju compound that he would try and learn it. He read and reread the scroll that said how the Jutsu worked, and then finally tried it out. Molding a little bit of chakra into his hands, he created his first cage bunshin. However the bunshin looked pale, so he had essentially failed to do it correctly. 
Pouring more chakra out, he tried again. He did this for about an hour and a half until his results finally bore fruit. This time he was rewarded with two exact solid replicas of himself. The scroll had said that when a cage bunshin was destroyed and or dispelled, the user would regain its memories. He had the two cage bunshin to read over the Mizu bunshin and when they dispelled he learned what he needed to do for the Mizu bunshin. It was almost four in the afternoon when he finally decided to check out the Senju compound. Of course he didn't know where exactly the Senju compound was, but that didn't matter. There was always an Anbu member outside his compound just in case he needed to go somewhere. This time there was an Inu masked Anbu instead of the Nako. This Inu masked Anbu had dark black hair and did not seem to be very friendly. Naruto stepped outside of the gates and locked it with his chakra. The Inu member then appeared right next to him and asked. What do you need? Naruto said. I wish to see the Senju compound before my fight tomorrow. Could you show me the way? The Inu Anbu nodded and told him to follow. Inu jumped up on the roofs and waited for the boy to come. Naruto instead of jumping all the way up just walked up the wall. After seeing Naruto up on the roof with him, he started to jump along the rooftops. Now Naruto had never done this before. Well he did it with trees and they were a lot higher up than most of these buildings that he was jumping across. Now sometimes his foot would slip and the Anbu member had to catch him. On more than one occasion Inu asked if he wanted him to shunshin them over to the Senju compound. Every time he refused saying that he would rather learn the way by foot, or rooftop so that he wouldn't need an escort every time he wanted to switch houses. They both arrived at the compound and as Naruto walked in, Inu promptly left to report to the Hokage. The compound was a lot larger than his father's was, and was simply breathtaking. The entire area was covered in wild plants that sprouted up from the light green grass. There were also plenty of different trees surrounding the compound. Some of the trees even had holes in them. Unfortunately a lot of the trees were uprooted and the ground to the side was completely upturned. He walked over to the place where the trees had fallen and used his wood manipulation to make them stand upright again. He then went over to the hole and used a very low level katan jutsu he found in a scroll while roaming in the forest years ago. The earth was baked after a few minutes of the constant heat and soon turned into a very hard substance like rock almost. After he did that, he started to meditate and soon enough where there used to be a large hole in the ground was now a very small pond. Smiling at his work, he went to go explore the house. Since it was a large compound he created a cage bunshin to help him get used to the place. Hokage's office. Sarutobi was calmly sighting in his office while staring at his old student ranting about how she was dragged back to the village and about the mission she just got back from. His other student Jiraiya was standing in the back of the room with a large bruise on his face. Apparently Tsunade got a little violent after her extremely stupid mission. Rubbing his temples he looked pleadingly over at Jiraiya to make Tsunade stop her rant. Jiraiya tried to calm Tsunade down but he just ended up getting hit punched in the face. Again. You're telling me that you had me dragged back here because I had plenty enough time to mourn my family. So I came back, begrudgingly but I still came back. And now when I come back from some mission to heal some stupid daimyo across the world in some remote country that I don't even know what the hell it's called, you tell me that I have some kind of missing relative that everyone believes is my son? That's major bullshit. I have never had a kid. Tsunade was fuming. I have to agree with Tsunade she couldn't have had a kid with Minato, he was married to Kashina Uzumaki. I was there at the secret wedding and even saw the kid's birth. Hell Minato and Kashina even named him after the main character in one of my books. When he said this Tsunade raised an eyebrow at him. Not one of those books Heim, it was the first book I wrote that didn't sell very well. He could only sigh as he watched his students bicker and then start throwing punches. When Tsunade finally got a solid punch on Jiraiya sending him out the window he decided to put an end to it. I know you don't have a son Tsunade, but he might as well be. You could adopt the boy anyways to make him your son since he is technically part of your clan though distantly. His real name is Uzumaki Namikaze Naruto, and he also has the Mokaton. Tsunade along with Jiraiya who had just jumped back in the window was shocked. Now I have seen proof of this since he displayed a skill that I haven't witnessed since I was taught Hashirama Sensei. A shit-eating grin was on his face. Haha and I get to fight this kid so you can determine his rank. That's awesome. I was going to train him anyways when the kid was older so this is just great. A smack to the head stopped him though. There's no way in hell I'm going to let you turn my son into a pervert like you. 
If I so much as hear or catch a glimpse of you showing the kid one of your books or trying to enlighten him on certain things I will not hesitate to beat you all the way to that random daimyo's in country. Do you understand me? To further emphasize her point she cracked her knuckles. For fear of being punched again he immediately nodded his head. Serutobi smiled at his students. Of course Tsunade, Jiraiya kun here was named the boy's godfather, so he does have certain rights. You can't block him out completely. As he finished Tsunade glared at him. Look I'm sorry Tsunade-chan but he should be in Naruto's life if not just because he trained his father. So he is the best one to tell Naruto about his father. She had to agree with her sensei. She never even knew Minato that well. Only when he was still a little kid did she actually speak with him. So I get to test the kid tomorrow right? Serutobi nodded. Well it's been great sensei, but I think I'm gonna go out and see if I can gather some information. Don't know if there's a threat to Konoha or anything. He then jumped out of the window after giving Serutobi a wink. Glancing over at Tsunade he gave her a new mission report folder. She grabbed the folder and scanned it. As she was reading the long-term S rank mission, she couldn't help but let her lips curl slightly upwards. This was perhaps the greatest mission assignment she had ever gotten. It said, this mission whether you choose to accept it or not, though I assume you will love to, is to make sure Jiraiya does not peep on any women while he is in Konoha. You may use any means necessary short of killing him or having him incapacitated for more than two months. I still need my spy master after all don't I Kami she loved her magnificent sensei. I mean he just gave her free reign on beating up Jiraiya. Besides anything she broke she could just heal right back up to pristine condition. No Jiraiya wouldn't die by her hand, maybe severely injured and make him cry like a little girl but no he wouldn't die. Like Jiraiya she jumped out the window and went over to one of the many bathhouses in Konoha. Serutobi lightly chuckled at his students as he pushed the buzzer next to him on his oak desk. Hideki-san, would you please get someone up here to repair one of the windows? He stood up and walked towards the broken window. Cupping his hands behind his back he stared out at the village he loved so much. Even the smallest things like the trees blowing in them made him smile. It was a hard job that he had. Constantly sending out men and women he loved on missions that might kill them. But that's what being the Hokage meant. To make the hard decisions for the good of the village. He just hoped with Naruto's new development as a Senju and a Namikaze wouldn't provoke any of the other hidden villages into a war. Senju Compound. Like his father's house, the Senju Compound also had a library. It was mainly filled with Sweeten and Doden Jutsu, although there were a few scrolls on other subjects as well. He had just read about a Doden Jutsu called Doten, Gansetsukan. Apparently it was very like one of his Mokotan Jutsus, it basically just turned the stone or earth from the ground into a large staff that he could use as a weapon. This was a great jutsu to have just in case he was unarmed during a fight he could create a new staff if his wooden one was destroyed. There was a variation of the jutsu that enabled the user to create multiple staffs and fire them at the enemy, but he did not have time for that right now. Just then, a resounding bang was heard from the front entrance of the building. The sound came from the door slamming against the wall thanks to the last true senju. He walked out of the library and through a few halls until he reached the main hall. Standing behind an extremely happy blonde woman was a brown-haired woman carrying a small little pink pig. He awkwardly rubbed the back of his head and said, Hello. I'm Senju Namikaze Naruto, who are you three? Tsunade looked down the hall and squinted. The kid did look exactly like Minato when he was a kid. My name's Senju Tsunade and this is my apprentice Shizune and her pig ton ton. You Naruto-san are not a Senju, yet. He ed his head to the side. What do you mean? Tsunade sighed. You're not a complete senju. Though you may have my family's blood in your veins it's very scarce, so I get to adopt you to make you a true senju. And mainly because everyone already thinks you're my kid anyway. Naruto looked confused for a little while until he finally managed to speak. So you're going to be my new Ka-san? And Shizune will be my Nei-chan? Yes yes we will. Are you okay with that? She said with tired sigh at the end. All she wanted to do was have a nice sleep after almost killing her stupid teammate 50 times. She did not expect for the kid to run up and give her a hug. He wasn't exactly as tall as her so his position was rather uncomfortable for her. She was about to send him flying across the compound when Shizune joined in the group hug. Now she couldn't exactly hit the kid without hurting Shizune in the process so she would let it go. This time. After the embrace, she gave the kid a gentle punch. Well gentle for her may have been a little hard since the kid had to step back. 
I'm going to bed. Do whatever you want to do. Just don't disappoint me and beat up my idiot teammate tomorrow. The next day, when he woke up after practicing the Doden Jutsu the other day, he, Tsunade, and Shizun walked over to the council chambers. On the way to the chambers, everyone was staring at them and whispering while looking. Some people had tried to come up and shake his hand. After the third attempt, since he didn't want to shake random people's hands, they went to the rooftops for the rest of the way. As they reached the Hokage Tower, they were then escorted towards the council chambers. Meanwhile Serutobi was waiting patiently while he listened to the clan heads and civilian council talk amongst themselves. He thought it would be good to have the civilian council meet the Senjus. If not just to make them not feel ostracized, this was a mistake since the civilians were screeching like banshees talking about Naruto. After sending a tad bit of his key around the room, he got the civilians' attention. He then said, please talk quieter if you would. The civilians immediately grew silent and started to talk in extremely low whispers, well low for them. They didn't have the finer hearing as trained shinobi did. The noise wasn't as bad as before though, and for that he was thankful. Just when he was finally content with the small amount of noise, Tsunade, Shizun, and Naruto walked in the room. With that the silence was destroyed as the civilians erupted into questions and exclamations. Once again Serutobi's key filled the room, and the room became quiet again. Now that we're all here, we can go over things. Soom, I give you the floor. Giving a grin to the old man, Soom addressed Naruto. All right kid, basically all you gotta do is show us your skills in this fight. Nobody expects you to put up a good fight, let alone beat Jiraiya Sama. Naruto just smiled brightly at them and nodded. Well then shall we? I really want to see this. The council then all got up and shushined out to the training ground they were using for the test. The civilians all went back home since it wasn't necessary for them to see the fight even though they would like to. There was no point in arguing anyways. Naruto went along with Tsunade since, one he didn't know the Shushin no Jutsu and two because he didn't know where the training ground was. When they got to the training ground, Jiraiya was already patiently waiting. As Naruto and Tsunade walked up to the grounds, Serutobi told them the match was about to start. Tsunade told him good luck, and then went over to the spectators' council. Standing a couple feet away from him stood the legendary Toad Sage. In all honesty, the man wasn't exactly what he expected. As he was about to talk, Jiraiya summoned a toad and started doing some odd dance proclaiming his title as the Toad Sage. Almost all of the spectators, himself included sweat dropped except for Hiyashi. Was this guy really serious? His guard was down for a few moments, and so he chose that time to strike. He threw three kanai towards the sage and then dashed into the trees. Jiraiya who was still dancing on top of the toad almost didn't notice the kanai. Luckily his experience allowed him to deflect them. He then stared into the trees where the kid ran off. He was hesitant to go in after him considering Serutobi told him the kid had the Mokaton. Finishing his hand seal, he shot out, Katen, Gokaku no Jutsu, towards the forested area. Just as the fireball was about to reach the trees, a wall of earth erupted from the ground. Then out of the trees came a spear of earth. Jiraiya expertly leaned to the side causing the spear to pass just slightly to the right of his side. He once again fired off the Katen. Gokaku no Jutsu, and again the wall of earth came up and protected the forest. He was then caught off guard as Naruto's foot almost slammed into his stomach. He had just managed to jump back just as Naruto appeared in front of him kicking his foot up. Bringing his leg back down, Naruto appeared behind Jiraiya and punched him in the back. Jiraiya felt the punch connect, although there wasn't much force behind it. He spun around and side kicked the gaki across the field. Naruto rolled across the grass and struggled to get back up. His eyes widened when he saw Jiraiya shout, Futan Gukuahou, he exhaled a huge compressed blast of wind. Thinking fast Naruto shouted, Mokaton, Mokaju Heki, the blast of air was deflected by his wooden wall that covered the small area around him. With a shout of, Katen, Karyu Enden, his wall, to Jiraiya's surprise was only slightly singed. The kid's wall could take a hit from a wind jutsu and then a B-ranked Katen Jutsu and not even get cracked. Good Kami this fight may be more interesting than he thought. He smacked aside a wooden spear with the flat side of a kanai. He was surprised with the wooden spear, but got into his battle stance. The kid was fairly good. Just because he had several Jutsus under his belt, and the knowledge of when to use them, he would be at least Chunin level. 
Well at least in ninjutsu he would be, he hadn't shown any other skills necessary to become a chunin, but the fight was still going on. Naruto jumped over his wall and swung his bow staff above his head before slamming it into the ground. Jiraiya smirked. So he wanted to get into a weapons fight huh? Well he never specialized with one, but he could improvise. He bent down just as the staff swung at his head. Grabbing two kanai in his hands, he charged the gaki. Each time he stabbed forward Naruto would block. The butt of Naruto's staff hit his left shoulder, turning him to the side. Just as he was about to slash the kid while turning on his heel, spikes jutted out of the end of the staff and stabbed him in his arm. He spun around and kicked the back of the kid's knee. Naruto stumbled and lost grip of his staff. He looked up at Jiraiya who was lightly rubbing his injured arm. Jiraiya was now holding his staff and was going to us it against him. He was confused as to why the kid was smirking at him when he suddenly disappeared. He couldn't sense the kid's chakra at all. The kid was either good at hiding his chakra, which should be unlikely considering he contained the Kyubi, or the kid was very far away. A fist came out of the staff and punched him right in the face. He immediately tossed the staff away from him and watched as the kid walked right out of it. He saw the kid going through more hand seals and before he finished launched his own jutsu. Katen. Goryuka no jutsu, five dragon fireballs shot out of his roaring for wood to burn. Mokaton. Mokasatsu shibari no jutsu, a mass amount of trees sprouted up from the ground protecting Naruto from the fireballs. A tree also grew behind Jiraiya and tried to trap him inside. Jiraiya just poofed and was replaced with a log that came out of nowhere. When Jiraiya landed, another tree grabbed him and grew all around him only leaving his head visible to the world. Jiraiya slowly shook his head as much as his bindings would allow. You're good kid, but you're not the best, he softly chuckled. Jiraiya then disappeared in a puff of smoke. A cage bunshin. Interesting. Naruto thought. Once his clone was released, Jiraiya came up behind him and slammed his foot into Naruto's back. He then followed up with kicking his legs underneath Naruto's and rammed a kanai into his arm. Jiraiya grimaced noticing the kanai went in very deep. His grimace faded from his face and transformed into the of a fish out of water. Dang, said Naruto and the disappeared in a very different way than Jiraiya had. His body had turned into wood and then slummed into the ground. Amoku Bunshin huh? I've only heard of that in the scroll of ceiling, pretty good kid. Just as he put his kanai away, Naruto kicked him from behind into one of the many trees he created. When Jiraiya hit the tree, Naruto came out of the tree and punched him in the stomach making Jiraiya spit. He then attempted to knee Jiraiya in the face. Jiraiya caught Naruto's knee and held it there. He twisted him and punched him in the face propelling him back to the tree. Instead of impacting the tree, Naruto melted into the tree and then came back out on one of its branches. Before Naruto could move, Jiraiya grabbed his neck and slammed him into the ground creating a five-foot crater. There was now blood coming out of Naruto's nose. Just because this is a test doesn't mean I'd go easy on you kid. You've already proven yourself chunin material, why don't you quit now? Jiraiya whispered into his ear. Naruto with his eyes still closed due to the pain spit into Jiraiya's face. I'll never give up he managed to mumble out. When Naruto opened his eyes again, they weren't his normal blue anymore, they were blood red with swirling black commas. Jiraiya backed up in shock realizing what those eyes were. At first he thought of the Kyubi when he saw the red, but the black commas, there was only one thing like that. The Sharingan, but how is that possible? thought Jiraiya. As soon as Jiraiya thought that, three kanai were sent at him. Jiraiya shook out of his stupor and used Kawarimi. He shook himself back into battle mode, the shock of seeing the Sharingan having worn off. Seeing an opening in the kid's defenses he punched Naruto in the gut sending him flying backwards. He didn't give Naruto the chance to respond and quickly knocked him out with a rather forceful hit to the head. Jiraiya then picked up Naruto and slung him over his shoulder. He then went back over to where the rest of the council was standing admiring the fight. This was a fight that would have been spectacular in the upcoming Chunin exams. Not only would it show the leaf's strength, but also introducing the rebirth of the Senju clan. When Jiraiya came out of the newly made forest, the council started walking over to him. Tsunade immediately punched Jiraiya in the face and got to work on scanning Naruto for any injuries. As Tsunade was preoccupied with Naruto, Jiraiya got back with a bruise on his face and made his report. The kid is at least high chunin, low junin in ninjutsu, and taijutsu. 
His bojutsu is also fairly good however I cannot accurately say how he would rank in that regard. Serutobi nodded. Yes you never learned bojutsu to my disappointment. I would have loved to teach you. But he is adept at it, however he does not seem to have a distinct style. Perhaps I will show him mine. In all regards I would put him as a low junin class. If not just because he has amazing potential and is fairly well rounded. I have a feeling he will be good with genjutsu considering the fact that he has the kaiubi in him and another factor. Soom was confused. Why would having the kaiubi within him give him an aptitude for genjutsu? Don't you need the control of a medic nin to be able to do them? I'd think with the mass amount of chakra that he has would never allow him to use a genjutsu. The rest of the council all agreed. Yes you'd be right normally Soom san but you have to remember the kaiubi is a kitsune, and they are known tricksters. So I believe that he can be able to use genjutsu effectively. What about the other factor Jiraiya Sama? You said besides the kaiubi there was another reason for him to be good with genjutsu, Shikaku said. Ah yes I did. Well it would appear that Naruto along with the Mokotan, has another bloodline. The Sharingan of the Uchiha clan. The council members gasped, and were shocked. None more so than Fugaku. How is that possible, he has no Uchiha blood in him. Well I believe that it may be the Kayubi's dealing. Mainly because I have no other explanation. Jiraiya stated calmly while being glared at. Everyone seemed to accept this, though Fugaku was still curious as was Shikaku. Tsunade had just finished healing Naruto and was lifting him up off the ground. At first Naruto stood a little shakily, but then was able to stand with Tsunade's help. Unlike before, Naruto's eyes were once again his regular blue. Eyeing the council, Naruto asked. So how did I do? Serutobi smiled and gripped the boy's shoulders. You did very well Naruto my boy. And if the council agrees with me, we'd like to instate you as a chunin. Serutobi then looked behind him and saw everyone nod in agreement. Naruto beamed with pride and grabbed the old man in a hug. After he was finished he stepped back and bowed. Arigato Hokage-sama. He also bowed to the council members as a whole, who in turn nodded to him. Now on to another thing Naruto. Serutobi began. The council members were all smirking. How'd you like to be a proctor in the Chunin exams next month? What do you mean I have to proctor the exam? I'd have no clue what to do, said Naruto. Hiyashi stepped forward and started to explain. You won't be proctoring by yourself. And you'll be in your home so to speak. You and one of our Junin will be proctoring the part of the exam within the forest of death. As of now, we do not know what the teams will be doing in the forest so you will have time to do whatever you need to do. He looked over at Fugaku who had also stepped forward to speak with him. If you would please, channel chakra into your eyes. Just to shed some light on recent knowledge. Naruto did as he was requested, and channeled a little chakra into his eyes. Like before, his cerulean eyes turned blood red with two spinning commas. Fugaku stood impassively and just nodded his head. So Jiraiya-sama told the truth. You really do have the Sharingan. If you ever need help with your eyes, just come over and speak with me. He then turned around to face the rest of the council. I believe this information concerning the boy containing the Kayubi should be considered an SS rank secret. If not just because Hokage Sama told us the Kayubi Jinshuriki died years ago, so he obviously does not want it to be known. The council all agreed and then left to their respected homes. Jiraiya, Tsunade, Serutobi, and Naruto were all that were left in the training ground. Jiraiya went off to do whatever he does on his free time, and Serutobi left to go work on more paperwork. Tsunade went to take her post at the hospital, where she was just elected the head of. Naruto stayed in the training ground and promptly made three cage bunshin. The three bunshins all ran off in different directions. One went over to the Namikaze compound to look at some of his father's jutsu scrolls, another left to the Senju compound to read more on Doton and Sweeten manipulation and the final one left to the village's library to read up on its history. Naruto himself created another 10 cage bunshin to work on chakra control, while he worked on his endurance and strength. While he was running around the training ground, the bunshins were running up and down trees. After each lap around the training ground, he did 20 sit-ups and 20 push-ups on his knuckles, every lap increasing push-ups and sit-ups by 5. He did this for 10 laps. When he finally finished, he plopped down on the grass. Well almost, he was really floating on his own chakra since he didn't want to hurt the grass. He had learned how to block out the grass and nature from talking to him. 
didn't want people to think he was insane talking to himself. He was tired from his workout, and so he just decided to rest his eyes for a little while. He didn't get 10 minutes of rest before a load of information swarmed his mind. The cage bunchen at the Senju compound had just dispelled after studying a few scrolls on nature manipulation. The first step of Doton manipulation was to be able to move the soil around the ground. After doing so, you would compress the soft earth into a hard rock. The smaller the rock was showed how good you were at the manipulation. He sat back up and pressed his hands down on the ground. The ground around him rippled a little, and so he slowly lifted up his hands. When he lifted up his hands, a very small patch of dirt came up with them. However the dirt fell from his hands after a few seconds. He tried once again, and was able to hold onto the earth for a few more seconds. After going through this process 15 more times, with no luck at even making it to the compressing into a rock step, he finally gave up on his own and summoned his cage bunchen who were running up and down the trees. The clones now sat in a meditative position and were trying to pull the earth towards them. Since he couldn't work on making his own rocks, Naruto decided that he'd just work on moving the earth faster. He and his clones arranged themselves in one large circle. Of course he needed to make more clones to fill in the gape, so along with him. There were 20 Naruto's all sighting in a circle. The purpose of this was to not necessarily move the ground back and forth, but to create a basin which he could then fill with water. So in doing this he had to pull the soil out of the ground, and create the large basin for which he would use to practice sweeten manipulation at a later time. With the excess dirt he put into a pile, his clones would then try to compress into hard rock. That wouldn't come for a long time since they had hardly moved the soil at all. In front of the clones was a small two inch deep trench. That was all their progress in 10 minutes of working. The farther the soil they were trying to move was, the harder it was to move it. In order to make it easier, all the clones focused on separating the ground into four sectors. Another 10 minutes later, there were now three small trenches. The trench circling the ground, a horizontal and vertical trench splitting it into four sectors. When this was done, Naruto dispelled the 19 clones helping him and absorbed their knowledge on how to move the earth. Naruto then attempted to take on the challenge himself. He was surprised to see that now the soil moved fairly easier for him than when he was first starting out. Now after 20 minutes of removing the earth from sector 1 by himself, he created more cage bunchen to work on the other sectors. Behind him lay a 20-foot pile of dirt and clay that he pulled out of sector 1. So as to not let any more dirt fill in his hole, he used to quick katen jutsu to bake the earth into hard clay. The clones had finished faster than he had expected and all created their own separate piles of dirt. There were only four thin clay walls that stopped the basin from being connected. Naruto with the help of his 20 cage bunchens lifted the first plate of clay and dumped it on one of the four piles. Clay was a lot harder to move than the regular dirt. When they had finished moving all the clay, the clones all went to a pile of earth. Five clones surrounded each of the four piles and placed their hands on it. Now they were trying to compress the dirt into rock with their chakra. Unlike what the scroll said, they wanted to have large rocks so they could implement another step. Meanwhile, a purple-haired woman watched Naruto train from a tree branch. The woman licked a kanai and then flung it at one of the many clones. The kanai sliced his right arm, and then he exploded in a puff of smoke. The surrounding clones all spun around and faced the direction from where the kanai was thrown. Suddenly one by one the clones were being pulled into the ground. Naruto watched calmly as each of his clones were being destroyed. He created a cage bunchen and then threw a smoke bomb on the ground. When the smoke cleared, three black snakes were rushing at him. Naruto dodged to the left and lifted up an earth spike where he once stood. The spike hit one of the snakes, and it disappeared. A snake summon? Maybe I should call out Isamu to play with them, thought Naruto as he once again dodged to the left. He wiped out a kanai and slashed one of the snakes. The snake bit down on the kanai before it could penetrate its skin. Naruto had to let go of the kanai to dodge another snake striking from his side. He did a backflip away from the snake and went through hand seals. Sweden. Swigonden. He opened his and shot out two water bullets at the snakes. One of them hit a snake, but had no effect. He was about to use the jutsu again when he felt a small prick in his side where his kidneys were located. He turned around to look at the face of his assailant. It was the beautiful purple-haired Kunoichi he had treated while he was still living in the forest of death. Anko licked his cheek and whispered in his ear. I still haven't properly thanked you for helping me yet. She eeped when Naruto went up in smoke, 
and felt an arm wrap itself around her waist and cold steel at her neck. I know a few ways you can thank me, Naruto huskily whispered. Anko turned around still being held by Naruto. What do you have in mind stud? She said rubbing her assets into his. Naruto removed the kanai from her neck and put it back in his weapons pouch. He put his hands around her waist and pulled her flush against his body. With his right hand he rubbed her cheek and moved her hair. Anko melted into his body, closed her eyes and leaned her head back. Naruto kissed the side of her neck and then kissed her left cheek and then right cheek. Just as she could feel his lips about to meet hers, she heard him whisper, you can help me train. Her eyes popped open and stared at the now grinning blonde. How dare he get her all excited and leave her just as they were getting started. She punched him, although he caught her fist. Feisty aren't we? Anko just growled at him. Ah don't be like that. All right all right, I'll treat you to lunch, how's that sound? Anko's frown transformed into a gleeful smile in the blink of an eye, and before he knew it, he was being dragged away. As they were passing through the village, many of the villagers were shaking their heads. He heard a few say, poor guy, and, may Kami have mercy on his soul. Now he didn't know why they were saying that, but he would soon find out. They had just arrived at an abandoned warehouse. Anko just pushed him in and followed him. Inside, there was a large bar with a dance floor to the side. The barkeep, who was using a rag to clean the inside of a glass looked over at them and smirked. Got a new toy there Anko? Shut up Mao. Just give me four plates of dango. This guy's paying. Anko then happily went and sat in a booth to the right of the bar, and across from the dance floor. Naruto just chuckled and rubbed the back of his head. I'll have a plate of dango as well. Never had it before, so might as well try it. Mao nodded and told him to go sit down. His food would be ready in a short while. Naruto walked over to the booth Anko was in, who was picking her teeth with a kanai. He sat on the opposite side of her. I don't think we've been properly introduced yet. My name's Naruto Namikaze Senju, and you are? Anko Mitarashi, Konoha's snake mistress. Anko said, sipping some sake that was just delivered to the table. So what do you have in mind for training? Naruto smiled. Well I have two months to train until the Chunin exams. Anko held up her hand. Hold up, I thought you already were a Chunin. You even have the vest. Yes. As I was saying until you rudely interrupted me, Anko pouted. I'm going to be proctoring one part of the exam, and so I felt the need to train more. And I was hoping that you could help me out sometimes. Anko sat back in the booth with her fingers tapping the table. What would I be helping you with, and what would I get in return for this? He seriously didn't think that she'd help out for nothing. Well you'd be helping me with target practice, and what would you like in return? After the words came out of his, he immediately felt like he would regret it. Ah interesting. Well for starters you'll have to treat me to lunch for at least a week. Anko's face lit up as Naruto nodded in agreement. She then pulled him across the table and kissed him. After the kiss ended, Naruto was just frozen. Maybe if you're good, that'll happen more. Just then their food arrived, and Anko tore into her precious dango. Naruto was still in a state of shock and hadn't touched his plate of dango. Taking another bite of her dango, Anko promptly slapped Naruto out of his shock. Come on, snap out of it. Naruto shook his head and poured himself some sake. Anko eyed him warily. You ever had sake kid? It's really not for minors. Naruto just stared at her. I'm a shinobi. Age doesn't matter. He then took a sip of the sake and started to cough violently. Haha burns doesn't it? Anko said as she raised her own glass and finished the rest of her sake. Naruto finally stopped coughing and just glared at her. Hey! You're the one who thought you could drink. She just finished the rest of her dango, and got up. Sorry to cut this short Naruto-kun, but I have a mission. She then left the bar, and left him the bill. He did say he'd treat her to lunch anyways. The next day. Naruto woke up at 6 am and jogged over to the Namikaze compound. At this time, nobody was awake yet, so he was able to jog in peace. When he reached the compound, he quickly unsealed the gate, and then walked into the house. He then walked down the hallway until he reached the armory, where he grabbed a set of weights. He put 40 pounds on each of his wrists, and then 80 pounds on each leg. When the weights were firmly secured on his body, he began to run 50 laps around the compound. After he finished running his laps, he did 50 push-ups and a 100 sit-ups. That along with running took him 2 an hour to do. He was now sweating profusely, but still wasn't that tired yet. 
He then got up from lying on the ground catching his breath and jogged over to the small pond that was in the compound. He jumped in the water and then started to swim 30 laps from where he jumped into the edge on the other side. When he finished this he jumped into the shower and then ate breakfast. Of course the only thing that was in the house kitchen was ramen. Apparently his father was a large ramen freak. Well either his father was, or maybe his mom was. He didn't know. Of course he knew Tsunade wasn't a ramen fanatic at all. He never did think of Tsunade as a mother, well at least not yet. He didn't really know her yet. Until 11 am he decided to read up on a few scrolls on taijutsu that were in the library. At 11 o'clock he went back into the yard and flew through seals. Kachiyo say no jutsu. A large puff of white smoke exploded from the ground, and out of the smoke came a large tiger. The tiger looked around until he finally spotted Naruto. Naruto. Nice to see you again, it hasn't been that long though. Naruto walked up to Shin and hugged him. Nice to see you too Shin, but I was hoping you could help me with my taijutsu. Of course, whatever you want, Shin said as he jumped back. Alright Naruto, come stand five feet next to me. Naruto then moved five feet to the right of where Shin was standing. Now I don't do this often, but I guess I will have to for this. Shin erupted in a puff of smoke, and a tall grey-haired old man replaced him. To teach you taijutsu properly, I figured it would be better to henge into a human. Right. Now then watch me run through this keita. Naruto watched as Shinwa went through a taijutsu form, and tried to commit it to memory. When Shinwa finished, he told Naruto to do it with him. Naruto failed at going through it at first, but Shinwa kept teaching him. After an hour of going through different katas, they were finished for the day. Shinwa released his henge, and then sat down with Naruto to work on strategy. He began telling Naruto about the various battles Hashirama and he had. For another hour, the two just went on about battle situations, and what to do given a certain situation. After the hour, Shinwa went back home to the summon realm, and Naruto went off to go eat lunch. He walked into a small little restaurant and quietly ate his sushi. When he finished eating lunch, he walked over to the Hokage Tower, and requested a meeting with the Hokage. The receptionist just told him to go right in, since he wasn't in a meeting right now. Naruto walked in the Hokage's office, and saw Serutobi quickly closing a drawer in his desk. He looked up and Naruto and said, What can I do for you Naruto? Requesting a mission perhaps? Naruto shook his head. No I'm actually looking for Anko Mitarashi. You wouldn't happen to know where she would be would you? Serutobi pulled out a mission scroll. Well she already returned from her mission, so she's either at training ground 44, or she's at the dango bar. Have you checked them yet? No but thank you for the information. Naruto then left the office, and tried the forest of death first. Of course the forest was massive, so it would take him a long time to find her. To make it easier, he created a hundred cage bunshin and sent them out to search for her within the forest. One of his clones went over to the tower in the middle of the forest, and found her lounging around. He quickly dispelled himself, and gave the real Naruto the knowledge of where she was. Naruto then quickly ran over to the tower, and walked up to her. Would you like to help me train now? He asked her. Anko just shrugged her shoulders and flung a kanai at his face. Naruto moved to the side and let the kanai pass harmlessly by his face. What the hell was that? Why'd you attack me? Anko just grinned. You said you wanted me to help you with target practice, so that's what I'm doing. She threw two kanai at him this time. Naruto pulled out his own kanai and deflected the two projectiles with relative ease. I meant for me to practice. I'm not going to be your own personal pincushion. Naruto said dodging four kanai this time. Oh well why didn't you just say so, come on. Anko said as she then dragged him out of the tower. She finally stopped when they were at a large cleaning. Alright to work on your target practice. You'll have to fight whatever comes to try and eat us by only throwing your kanai and shuriken, or senbon. Whatever works for you. A large brown snake emerged from the trees and hissed at them. Oh goody, your first target. The large snake raced forward, opened its and prepared to swallow them. Naruto jumped to the side and flung two kanai at its head. The snake recoiled as the kanai flew by its head. The snake turned towards him again and hissed. Naruto threw his shuriken and kanai at the snake's head and side. Once again the snake coiled, and the kanai that were heading towards its face missed. However, the shuriken he threw hit the body of the snake, and cut its flesh. To the snake, this wasn't a bad injury, but it made it incredibly angry. 
Naruto figured he'd never be able to kill the snake with just a kunai, especially ones he had to actually throw. He made a tactical retreat through the trees. The snake slithered after him, uprooting trees that it hit. Naruto winced every time a tree fell. As Naruto was running, he'd throw a kunai or shuriken back at the snake. Most of the projectiles would miss, however some made it and cut up the snake's face. After an hour of running and trying to kill the snake, Naruto felt very tired. The snake stopped chasing after him and turned around to slither back into the dense forest, hissing in anger all the way. Naruto trudged back to the tower, throwing more kunai at much smaller predators. When Naruto reached the tower, it was already 5 o'clock p.m., and Anko was chewing on a stick of dango. He walked up to her and threw a kunai that cut her dango stick in half. When she looked up to face him, he told her that they were done for the day, and he was going home. Walking home, nobody particularly paid him any attention. They were all too busy manning their own stores and doing errands. Considering the fact that his return wasn't made public yet, was probably the reason no one was paying him attention. He liked it that way. Opening the gate to the Namikaze compound, he summoned his bow staff from the ground and created a training dummy made out of wood. He then spent the next two hours striking at the dummy. He had gone through at least 50, since they were as frail as a human body. Especially when he hit the head, it would just break off due to the force of his hit. Of course he was also using his wood manipulation to lengthen the staff, and to cause Spike to come out of the sides. Since he was tired, he went into the library in his house, and grabbed his father's scrolls on the basics of Fuenjutsu. For another two hours until 9 p.m., Naruto and his clones read the scrolls, while the real him worked on his calligraphy. A good Fuenjutsu specialist had to make the seals perfect, lest he want his or her head blown off due to a misshapen line. As he was working through the Fuenjutsu scrolls, he ate dinner. At 9, Naruto flopped down on the bed in his room. This would be his normal routine for a week, until he changed it for the next week. Week 1 6 am physical training, 50 laps around the training grounds, 40 lbs on each wrist and 80 lbs on each leg followed up by 30 laps in the large pond. 10 am shower and breakfast 11 am chakra control, strategy, taijutsu training with shinwa. 1 pm lunch 2 pm target practice, advanced tracking and stealth in forest of death with anko. 5 pm bojutsu practice 7 pm dinner, and fuenjutsu theory. 9 p.m. to 9.30 chakra control before bed week 2 6 a.m. physical training, 80 laps around the training grounds with 80 pounds on each wrist and 160 pounds on each leg and 50 laps in the pond. 10 a.m. shower and breakfast 11 a.m. chakra control, strategy, village politics and law. 1 p.m. lunch 1.30 p.m. bojutsu training with Serutobi. Luckily for him, Serutobi agreed to take some time off work to help him. Of course to be able to train with Serutobi he had to tell him the secret to beating paperwork. That truly was a funny day. When he told him, Serutobi called Jiraiya into the office, and then pulled out a small circular sheet of paper and started slamming his head against it. Jiraiya had taken a picture of this for his own enjoyment. 5 p.m. Chakra Control, Practice on Genjutsu 7 p.m. Basics of Fuenjutsu. 9 p.m. Chakra Control 10, 00 p.m. Bedtime Week 3 6 a.m. Physical and Earth Manipulation Training. 400 punches and kicks with each arm and leg against a training post with 100 pounds on each wrist and 200 pounds on each leg and 100 laps in the pond. 10 a.m. shower and breakfast 11 p.m. chakra control, dodenjutsu and bojutsu training with serutobi sensei. 1 p.m. lunch 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Sweden manipulation 3.35 p.m. genjutsu training Itachi. He had met Itachi when he went over to the Uchiha compound to talk to Fugaku about the Sharingan. Aiko had told him that she had tweaked his Sharingan for him. She had apparently taken away the curse, and allowed him to gain the Mangekyo without killing his best friend, but by training. If he did it through training, he wouldn't go blind, and wouldn't have his eyes stressed each time he used one of its jutsus. He also met Itachi's little brother Sasuke. He always talked about his team. Mainly about his peverted sensei Hitaki Kakashi. Apparently all Kakashi really taught them was teamwork, and the tree climbing exercise. 5 p.m. Intermediate Fuen Jutsu Training 8 p.m. Dinner. 8.30 p.m. Chakra Control and Target Practice with Anko. 10 p.m. Bedtime Week 4 6 a.m. Physical and Earth Jutsu Training. 1,000 punches and kicks with each arm and leg. 10 a.m. Shower and Breakfast 10.45 a.m. Chakra Control, 
target practice and then bojutsu training with serutobi sensei 1 30 pm lunch 2 pm water jutsu 4 pm genjutsu and sharingan with itachi and makoto itachi's mother makoto was a retired junin and in the whole uchiha clan she was the most proficient in genjutsu right behind her was itachi who just adored genjutsu 5 pm intermediate fuin jutsu 7 pm stealth training sneaking into the anbu headquarters and borrowing some shuriken without being caught 10 o'clock bedtime week 5 6 a.m sparring with shinwa 9 a.m shower and breakfast 10 a.m sparring with anko 1 p.m lunch with anko 2 p.m planning the chunin exam with anko 5 p.m advanced fuinjutsu theory 8 p.m dinner 10 p.m bedtime by now the chunin exams were just a week away from beginning the reason there was still a week left was because teams from other countries were still filtering in Two teams from Takigakir had just arrived yesterday, and the San team just got in today. That was fun meeting that team, along with one of the teams from Konoha. Flashback. Naruto was walking down the street, when he heard a little kid that sounded like Konohamaru shouting let me go. He followed the voice, and found a pink-haired girl, and a short brown-haired boy standing across from a sand nin holding up Konohamaru. He noticed to the left up in a tree, there was another red-haired San Nin standing above Sasuke Uchiha. Yes he had met Sasuke before when he trained with Itachi and his mother. He had eaten lunch with them, and he could say that Sasuke seemed like a nice boy. He certainly could have turned out worse. All he wanted to do was make his big brother proud of him. Of course Itachi was proud of Sasuke, but Sasuke hadn't figured that out yet. Speaking of Sasuke, those must be his teammates down there, Sakura Haruno, and Takashi Higaru. Instead of rushing in to help him, he just leaned against the wall putting a genjutsu over himself while he observed. Hey clown face, let go of Konohamaru. The short brown-haired leaf shinobi shouted at the one holding up Konohamaru. This kid bumped into me, he's not going anywhere until I teach him a lesson. The sand nin that was wearing makeup said. The blonde girl standing next to him whispered to him. Konkuro let the kid go, it was just an accident. Shut up Tamari. The kid needs to learn a lesson. The boy now known as Konkuro was about to throw the kid up in the air, when a large rock hit his hand. Konkuro dropped Konohamaru due to shock. When he noticed him running away, he reached behind his back and was going to pull out something that was wrapped in bandages. Just then a swirl of sand erupted from the ground, and then the red head that was standing in the tree with Sasuke was standing right next to Konkuro. Jigara? What are you doing here? Konkuro stuttered out. Shut up Konkuro, you're a disgrace to our village. Gara then turned his attention over to the three leaf nin and Konohamaru. Mother wants blood. A tendril of sand launched after Konohamaru who was running behind Takashi. Before the sand even got within five feet of them, a wall of water rose up and blocked it. All of the sand became wet, obviously, and dropped to the ground. Naruto then walked away from the wall, and released the genjutsu around him. He smiled when he heard two shouts from Konohamaru and Sasuke. Ototo, Naruto san. Naruto turned away from the sand nin and smiled. Hello, Sasuke, Konohamaru. He then turned back towards the sand nin and flared some of his killer intent at them. Tamari and Konkuro started sweating while Gara was only slightly twitching. That was not a good idea, sand nin. If I hadn't interfered when I did, you could have hurt the Hokage's grandson. Wars have been started for less. You wouldn't want to go to war with the leaf now would you? Konkuro paled since he was the one who had first threatened the kid, and was afraid he might be punished. Since the Chunin exam is only a few days from now though, I will forget this little incident. I'll have fun proctoring you little Konkuro. Now leave unless you really want to start a war. End flashback. Yes that was a fun morning indeed. Got to scare the crap out of some hopeful Chunins, and to top it off, he could scare them even more during the exams. Kami he had been hanging out with Anko way too much lately. Speaking of Anko, she was most likely trying to figure out her entrance after her superior, Ibiki finished the first set of the exam. Ibiki's test probably had some sort of psychological bullshit to mess with their minds. Sometimes the best way to persuade someone was to mess with their mind, instead of cutting them up like Anko loved. He walked up the steps of the building that Ibiki was teaching, in and then waited for Anko to make her entrance. Luckily he didn't have to wait long since she burst in the room through the window. Hello maggots, I'm the beautiful sexy Anko Mitarashi, and I'll savor your tears of pain. 
Right behind her there was a large banner that said she was also the proctor for the second part of the exam. She then went into a very provocative pose that left nothing to the imagination. Some of the examinees blew back due to a nosebleed. Just then, a large tree sprouted up from the floor, and branched out wrapping itself around the kinky purple-haired Junin. The tree branches that constricted Anko fell away and revealed a blonde Chunin, and I'm Naruto Senju. The second part of the exam will be at Training Ground 44, the Forest of Death. Be there in 20 minutes, or you fail the exams. Naruto then leaned back into the tree with Anko and they melted into it. The tree then exploded into hundreds of Sakura blossoms. All of the Chunin hopefuls raced off towards the training grounds. All of the Leaf Nin knew where it was, so they had the advantage. Not much of an advantage, but still every little bit counts. Sasuke and his team had reached the gate to the forest in 10 minutes. They were the first team to make it. When they got there, they saw Naruto and Anko munching on some dango. Naruto looked up at Sasuke and just nodded at him. He looked around, and saw all of the other teams filter in before time was up. Now he had to explain how this exam was going to work. Alright, this part of the exam is a survival test. Each team will be given a scroll of either heaven or earth. You will have to survive in the forest for five days and try to get the opposite scroll. You may make alliances with other teams, if you so wish. However to pass this test, you have to get to the tower in the middle of the forest with both scrolls, different teams cannot share scrolls. They have to have their own set of scrolls. If you do not wish to kill other teams, or in case other teams hoard scrolls, there will be more hidden in the dens of the creatures that live in the forest. Also you may only enter the tower on the fifth day. Have fun. Naruto then sat back against a tree while Anko said her part of the exam. Anko flung a kanai that cut the cheek of an Inazuka boy. She then appeared behind him and licked the blood from his cut. Naruto just couldn't resist. You really want to get AIDS don't you Anko-chan? Anko just smirked and said seductively. Bloody's just so, so intoxicating. She turned around to face all of the genin and exclaimed. Spill lots of blood for me. A short redhead from Suna decided then that he liked this woman, and she'd be the last one he'd kill. Anko then directed them towards different gates, and within moments, the second part of the Chunin exams began. Currently Naruto and Anko were just lazing around eating some dango in the tower in the middle of the forest of death. They had eaten enough dango that they were able to make a smiley face on the wall with the sticks. So do we just wait here for five days? Is that it? Naruto asked her. Anko didn't really respond to him, and threw another stick at the wall starting another picture. There really wasn't that much to do right now. They pretty much had to stay in the forest. Well at least one of them had to, and there was no way they'd let the other leave. They couldn't even interfere with the exam in any way. Well we could watch the teams kill each other maybe? And how would we do that exactly? Naruto asked her with an eyebrow raised. I may have set up a few cameras before the exam started, just to not get bored. Besides I want to see some blood. Considering you're the only other person here, would like to volunteer your blood for me. Anko said, using the puppy I know jutsu. Normally that would probably work on any living being, but having that look on the face of a crazy sadist just was not right. Naruto backed away waving his hands in front of himself. We can watch the little genin if that's what you want. Anko giggled gleefully, which in itself was very creepy, and pulled him towards the control room in the tower. Inside the room, there was a massive monitor that was pretty much the size of the entire wall. As soon as she sat Naruto down on the couch that was in there, Anko ran over to the screen and turned it on. She grabbed the remote and settled herself down next to Naruto. When she was all settled and comfortable, she turned on the cameras, and was prepared to enjoy the show. In the forest, the sand team had just met up with a team from Kusagakure. One of the Kusa Genin, obviously the leader walked up to Gara and gave his proposal. Why don't we team up and kill everyone else here, that way there will be far less competition later on. If you don't agree, well we'll just have to kill you. Gara just stared his cold eyes into the Kusa Genin. He then whispered, mother wants your blood. Just then San shot up from the ground and covered all three of the Kusa Genin. Tower with Anko. Anko clutched onto Naruto's left arm and exclaimed. Who do you think he's gonna kill them? I hope he kills them. There will be such glorious blood. Naruto just tuned her out and kept watching the screen. Anko was seriously messed up when it came to blood. Thank Kami she wasn't bored or else she would cut him up. Forest. 
One of the Kusa Genin was able to escape via Kawarimi while the other two were trapped in the sand. The sand imploded, and squashed the two little Genin. The last Genin alive just stared in fear. A tendril of sand the wrapped around his foot. The sand lifted him up and slammed him into a nearby tree. On impact he lost his breath. He tried to gasp for air, but then the sand rammed itself down his throat filling up his lungs. He couldn't breathe at all. It was getting to be unbearable. Gara was just moving his hand with a small grin on his face. Each time he even twitched his fingers, the small genin convulsed. Finally after a few minutes, the genin stopped moving completely. Gara then made his hand into a fist and then pushed it open. The sand that was inside the boy's lungs and stomach burst out, sending chunks of flesh and blood flying into the air. Anko and Naruto. Both of them just stared at the screen in shock. That may have been a little bit too far. Even Anko wouldn't do something that bad would she? Anko herself looked a little disgusted. It seemed as if the sadist had a limit. This genin was just like the man she hated. He did not care for life at all. They both decided that they had seen enough for the day, and so they left the room. Since there really wasn't much else to do, they just sparred for the rest of the day, and the next day as well. Heck they sparred for pretty much the entire time they were there. Fourth day, Team 7 had just gotten the other scroll that they needed, and were going to find a small space for refuge. They had teamed up with the other team's four teams from Konoha. Really there were only four teams left of the five. Kabuto's team was all killed on the first day by some team from Taki. All of the Konoha's teams, Team 8, 9, and 10 got their scrolls on the third day. That was when they had all found each other and started to work together. During their time in the forest, they always felt like they were being watched by someone, or something. In fact every team in the exams felt like they were being watched. It was not a good feeling to have at all. Takashi, Kiba, Shikamaru, and Choji were all talking among themselves, while Sasuke was conversing with Shino. The Abarame kid was actually very smart, and was like him in some ways. He knew when it was a good time to be silent. Unlike Kiba, Shino was able to refrain from speaking every single minute. Currently he and Shino were talking about the exams, until Shino threw a kanai into the bushes. Almost instantaneously everyone in their makeshift camp sprang into action. Shikamaru, Ino, Sakura, Hanada, and Tenten made a back defensive line pulling out Kanai and Shuriken. Hanada had also activated her Byakugan. While the girls and Shikamaru formed up behind them, Shino, Sasuke, Kiba, Choji, Takashi, Neji, and Kabuto formed a circle around them. They were the hard hitters, while the girls and Shikamaru were more support people. They all threw a kanai at the bushes where they heard a noise. Neji saw a distinct chakra source right behind the bush and shouted out to the person hiding there. Come out now, we know you're there. Kukuku. Well done Hyuga-san. Of course it is expected of you to find me so quickly. The woman who stepped out of the bushes said. She stared over at Sasuke and licked her lips. Now then why don't you play with a friend of mine while I play with little Sasuke-kun over here. The woman then summoned a large pitch black snake that then charged them. Everyone had to scatter away from the snake to avoid being eaten. However this was what the crazy woman wanted, she charged Sasuke and punched him in the face. Come now Sasuke-kun is this the best the Uchiha clan has to offer me? I'm very disappointed. Once she said this, her smirk that was on her face was wiped out when Sasuke kicked her in the stomach. Sasuke didn't stop there though. He kicked her legs out from underneath her and then punched her chin upwards sending her flying into the opposite tree. The creepy Kunoichi wiped her and spat out a glob of blood. Interesting Sasuke-kun, you don't even have your Sharingan activated yet and you can still do this. Let's up the speed a bit then. At the beginning of the fight, Sasuke was doing just fine. He could follow this Kunoichi's movements. But now all he saw were blurs. He was seriously being punched around like a pinball machine. Even when he activated his one comma Sharingan, it wasn't enough. Sure he could see her movements, but he wasn't fast enough to dodge or counter. So instead of using just Taijutsu, he resorted to Ninjutsu. Sasuke quickly finished some seals, Kaden. Habashiri, he shouted and a jet of fire sped towards the Kunoichi who had also finished her hand seals. He wasn't that surprised, when he noticed the Kunoichi was about to use a sweet Ninjutsu. The Kunoichi shot out a constant jet of water from her cancelling out his own fire. The Kunoichi then cancelled her jutsu and charged Sasuke, her neck expanding as she went. 
Sasuke was frozen on the spot after looking into the Kunoichi's eyes. There was no way she could be human. The Kunoichi was about to give Sasuke a very special kind of hickey when all of a sudden she was punched in face from the side. Because she already had the momentum, her face slammed into a tree. Seeing the Kunoichi miss him, Sasuke looked to the side and saw his friend Naruto. Naruto, what are you doing here? You aren't supposed to interfere, are you? Naruto, without taking his eyes off of the Kunoichi, told Sasuke, There is no specific rule that says we cannot interfere. It is mainly just a suggestion. However, when someone not taking the exam interferes and tries to attack a shinobi, it is our job to intervene. Many years before you or even myself were born, Kumo used the Chunin exams to try and steal the Byakugan. The Kunoichi was just getting back off the ground. Sasuke just go with your team and camp at the tower since you have both scrolls. There is a barrier around the outside that only lets those with both scrolls enter, and there will be no fighting at all. Just go quickly. Sasuke nodded and ran off before the Kunoichi got up completely. Naruto's attention locked onto the Kunoichi and said, Get out of my forest you snake bastard. He actually growled out the last part. The Kunoichi laughed and said, I don't know what you're talking about Proctor San. I am merely taking the test. Cut the crap Orochimaru. I know it's you. Naruto said as he pulled out a kanai. The Kunoichi now known as Orochimaru frowned. Hum now that you've found out my secret I'll have to kill you. You also let my prey escape me. For that you will die slowly. Orochimaru lunged forward and punched him in the face. Before the punch could connect, Naruto grabbed his fist and flipped Orochimaru over his head. Orochimaru quickly went through some seals and shouted, Katen, he and an, three balls of fire sped at Naruto who was going through his own hand seals. Sweden. Suakunden. A large shark made of water shot at the fireballs and quickly ate them. The shark decreased in size immensely but continued on its way towards Orochimaru. Orochimaru jumped to the side dodging the shark's teeth that were just about to rip through his flesh. The shark however changed its direction and once again shot towards Orochimaru. Doden. Doroku Gashi Orochimaru created a large wall of earth right in front of him that took the water shark's attack. He was just about to release the jutsu when Naruto jumped over the wall and slammed his bow staff right through his back spine. The part of his bow staff that was inside Orochimaru. Spikes protruded out from it and stabbed the Sanin in multiple places. Naruto summoned four more bow staffs from the ground. He rammed the first two through Orochimaru's hands, and the other two through his feet. Orochimaru tried to move, but found that he couldn't. He wasn't even able to access his chakra anymore. What, he began, spitting out blood, did you do to me? Naruto just looked down at Orochimaru and pulled out a kanai. He used the kanai to slice through Orochimaru's shirt and ripped it off. Orochimaru's eyes widened. No. What are you doing? I only like little boys. Shut up you pedophile. I'm not going to rape you. I'm not a sick er like you. Naruto summoned another bow staff, made the end into a large spike and rammed it through Orochimaru's shoulder blades. Orochimaru roared out in pain. After the pain subsided enough for him to speak, he asked again. What have you done to me? Naruto rummaged through his weapons pouch and finally answered. Inscribed on each of those bow staffs stabbed into you are chakra suppression seals. You currently have six cutting off your chakra. Naruto finally found what he was looking for. A large thin roll of paper. He unrolled the paper and started to put it along Orochimaru's back. His entire back was then covered in paper. With a small hand seal, all of the ink transcribed from the paper onto Orochimaru's back. Now his back was completely covered in black ink. When the ink left the scroll, Naruto removed the paper from his back and put it back into his weapons pouch. His finger then started glowing with chakra, and he put it over Orochimaru's forehead. He touched his forehead and proceeded in drawing a seal. The seal burned into Orochimaru's flesh and left a large mark. Naruto then stood back up and leaned against a tree. Orochimaru was just screaming at him to remove the seals. You have 10,000 small exploding seals inside your body, and only I can remove them. Now why don't you just sit back and wait for Anko and a team of Anbu to come and take you to the Hokage. Within a couple of minutes, Anko and a team of four Anbu came onto the scene. Anko kicked Orochimaru in the face, and then helped the Anbu carry him away towards the INT department. Orochimaru couldn't do anything at all, so he tried to rile up Anko. His curses and disappointed sounding voice finally made Anko crack. 
and she promptly struck him in the back. The seals that covered Orochimaru's back all lit up and started activating. The seal on his forehead also active and swallowed up Orochimaru in a black abyss. Anko and the Anbu jumped back and watched as Orochimaru was gone completely. Anko spun around towards Naruto and demanded. What happened? Not once did they notice a small white snake slithering away into the trees. Naruto kept looking at the spot where Orochimaru was. It would seem Orochimaru was able to access some of his chakra when you hit him. Because of the seals I put on him, they started to explode. The only reason nobody was hurt from the blast is because of the second seal I engraved on his forehead. That seal was a variation on the Urashisho. I shortened the effects of the seal to just around the area of Orochimaru's body. And instead of sealing everything into Orochimaru's body I sealed it into the last thing Orochimaru touched. This being a small little leaf. Orochimaru is now dead, and no force on earth should be able to bring him back to life. The Anbu leader walked up to him and told him to come with him. Apparently he had to give his report to the Hokage. Since he had to talk with the Hokage, that meant Anko had to stay alone in the tower and wait until the exam was over to actually do stuff. Hokage's office. The Anbu leader that brought him in was standing in the far back corner of the office, and vanished in the shadows. In the Hokage's office, Tsunade and Jiraiya were already speaking with Serutobi. When Tsunade saw him enter, she pulled him into a bone-crushing hug. Fortunately she released him just as he ran out of air. When he tried to explain himself to her, she just punched him in the face. Now she held back a lot considering he didn't fly through the wall. Serutobi ordered him to tell him exactly what happened, and how he even managed to kill him. Naruto then explained how he subdued Orochimaru. The only reason he won was because Orochimaru was holding back. He couldn't risk using too much of his power lest he gained the attention of the Anbu or the Hokage. So when he got hit with his bow staff, since it had chakra suppression seals on it, it messed up with his control, preventing him from using any jutsu. Serutobi sat back and smoked his pipe. Very well. I will give you the bounty for his head since we have eyewitnesses of his death. You may go back to the exams tomorrow when you've had a good rest. Naruto nodded and started walking towards the door. Before he got five feet to the door, Tsunade grabbed his collar and dragged him over to the Senju compound. Shizun was already making some dinner in the kitchen. She was going to say hi to them, but saw the look on Tsunade's face and just stayed in the kitchen. Tsunade sat Naruto on the couch and started chewing him out. Do you know how dangerous that was, you could have died. Orochimaru is one of the Sanin. You should have run from him, she kept this rant on about how he was stupid and all of that for another 10 minutes. I didn't die though, he did. So what's your problem? Naruto asked her. Tsunade just glared at him. Just don't do anything incredibly stupid again okay? She hugged him and then went into the kitchen to help Shizun. Forest of Death. Tower, due to the fact that too many teams passed through the forest, they were holding a preliminary round. The instructor for this part of the exam didn't look like he cared at all, and just told everyone but Sasuke and Samakado Yoroi to wait on the balcony above the arena. As everyone was leaving the arena, Kakashi appeared and told Sasuke to do his best. The fight began, and Sasuke was being forced on the defensive for a little while. Sasuke noticed each time he was hit, he lost a little bit of his chakra. He activated his Sharingan, and then the fight turned a little one-sided in Sasuke's favor. Apparently even when Sasuke hit Yoroi, his chakra was absorbed by Yoroi. Sasuke finished up the fight, by using the Omite Renge. He had copied this from Lee when they sparred just before going into the first part of the exam. Shino Abirame vs Zaku Abum. Humph, I wanted to fight the Uchiha. I'd be a legend if I beat him, Zaku mumbled as he walked down the steps into the arena. Shino like always was silent as he walked down to the arena floor. The fight. If you could even classify it as such was over very quickly, with Shino as the victor. Shino had noticed a few large holes in Zaku's arm guards, and sent his bugs to plug the holes. Zaku was able to use his Zanhaka, but Shino dodged it by going underground. When Zaku tried to fire off another Zanhaka, both of his arms exploded. His screams of agony were terrifying, and when he passed out, they knew it had to be extremely painful. As soon as the match was called, the medical ninja came and retrieved Zaku and sent him to the hospital. Takashi looked back at Kakashi and asked him what happened to Zaku. Kakashi then explained to him that because those holes were plugged up, Zaku's jutsu had nowhere to go, so it backfired on Zaku and exploded. 
Sabaku no Konkuro vs Sarugi Mitsumi This fight like Shino's was very quick. Although it was a loss for Konoha. Mitsumi had charged Konkuro and was about to kick him in the stomach. Before he got the hit, Konkuro's body opened up and swallowed up Mitsumi. It turned out Konkuro was actually nothing but a puppet, while the real Konkuro was on the puppet's back wrapped in cloth. Several kanai appeared and drove through holes in the puppet, impaling Mitsumi many times. He was dead before he even touched the ground. There was no real reason for the medics to be there, except to take away the body. Higirashi Tenten vs Sabaku no Tamari Like the battle with Konkuro, this fight was rather unfortunate for the leaf. The fight was extremely one-sided. Tenten just got an unlucky opponent. A wind user vs a weapons mistress that was just disaster for Tenten. Everything she threw at Tamari, was just blown right back at her by a wind jutsu. The blonde girl didn't even show off. All she did was unravel her battle fan and swing it. It had three moons, and when the third moon was shown, she would lose. Tenten paid no attention to the girl. There was no way she would lose and just did a dance with two giant storage scrolls, launching many weapons at Tamari. Even with all of the weapons, none of them were able to hit the sand nin. It was a fruitless effort, as all of her weapons were once again flung back at her. Tenten had gotten cut with her own weapons, and because of it she nearly passed out. Tamari was then just about to slam her fan into Tenten's stomach when Lee appeared and grabbed her up. That was a very unyouthful thing you were just about to do. To kick an opponent when she is clearly unable to fight back. I will run 20 laps for this unyouthfulness to make up for your non-existent youth. Another god-awful green spandex wearing weirdo appeared down in the stadium. Yash I will run with you Lee and if I cannot, I will climb the Hokage monument with only my thumbs. Yes Gai Sensei. Lee. Gai Sensei. Lee. Gai Sensei. The two hideous bowl cut shinobi began to hug each other, then a sunset with a beach complete with crashing waves appearing behind them. Normally this scene would melt people's hearts, with a sunset setting in the sky in brilliant shades of red, orange, and a tad bit of blue. But with the beauty was destroyed with the two hugging and screaming each other's names. The people in the stands shrieked in terror as they felt their eyes start to burn out of their sockets. Kuranai Yuhi. Konoha's Genjutsu mistress tried to dispel the obvious Genjutsu. She made the release seal, and even tried to overpower the Genjutsu. She put three quarters of her chakra into trying to dispel it, but it would not work. Why won't this dispel? It can't be real. It was so bad that some of the weaker genin committed seppuku to rid themselves of this monstrosity. Luckily the two hugging clones separated before any of the other genin died of unnatural causes. The next fight started immediately so that everyone could forget about the two odd hugging people. Haruno Sakura vs Yamanaka Ino So far this had to be the worst fight anyone had ever seen. The girls only used the things they were taught in the academy with a few thrown kanai and shuriken. And then they kept talking about who was going to marry Sasuke, it was very annoying. Ino had come out on top though, due to the use of her family's jutsu. She managed to trap Sakura with Shintenshin and forced Sakura to forfeit before Sakura could attempt to break free. Ino's sensei, Serutobi Asuma looked over at Kakashi and said, Have you taught her anything yet? Granted he hadn't taught Ino that much, but have her start learning her family techniques. Kakashi sighed. He knew that Sakura, as it is, isn't ready to be a kunoichi. I had taught her tree and water walking, but she just doesn't have enough chakra, and she's always trying to get Sasuke's attention. She just doesn't seem like she wants to learn. Nara Shikamaru vs Suchi Kin. Why do I have to fight a girl? Shikamaru grumbled as he went down into the arena. This is such a drag. Kin then jumped down from the balcony into the arena. You think because I'm a girl, this fight will be easy. Kin yelled angrily. Even from still being in the balcony, she still heard what Shikamaru had said. Shikamaru just played on the defense, dodging Senbon that the girl was throwing. Heck he even got her to tell him how her technique worked. Who in their right mind would tell an enemy the secret to their techniques? Kin had, from the beginning, thrown regular Senbon at Shikamaru. Later on, she threw more, but with bells attached to them. Through the bells, she casted a genjutsu on Shikamaru, making him see doubles. Of course Shikamaru, being the genius that he was, used his shadow possession to trap her. Then, Shikamaru said he'd kill her if she didn't forfeit. Of course this was a bluff, he wasn't going to kill her, but Kin didn't want to take that chance and forfeited. Inazuka Kiba vs Higaru Takashi, hell yeah! Kiba yelled, 
Let's win this Akamaru. The two then jumped down to the arena and were walking to the proctor. Takashi slowly walked down, infuriating Kiba since he really wanted to fight. Takashi didn't exactly care to fight, even though he was proficient in fight, he didn't exactly like to. Come on Takashi, Kiba growled, let's get this fight started. Kiba was really getting impatient, as was Akamaru who was barking inside of Kiba's hood. Just hold on Kiba, I don't even want to fight, but if Shikamaru did, I guess I have too. Takashi then stepped into his taijutsu stance and nodded towards the proctor. Kiba charged him, and punched his face. Naruto moved his head and struck Kiba's side with three fingers. He then hit the back of Kiba's spine with a chop of his hand. Akamaru had then jumped up to bite him, but he just pinched the dog's leg. Kiba started coughing up blood, and found he couldn't move his legs. What did you do to me? Kiba said between spitting out blood. He knew this was going to be a hard fight, but he didn't know it would be over so fast. Since Takashi came from a lesser known clan, he didn't know what to expect from him. Since he was an Inazuka, it was fairly obvious what he was going to do. Besides taking him out, Takashi had also disabled Akamaru by doing something to one of his hind legs. Takashi looked down at Kiba and put a kanai up to his neck. I'm not telling you my skills Kiba, to do so would give you an advantage in the future, and would give any of these genin from other villages information on me. I would rather remain unknown at the moment. Kiba knowing he had nothing else he could do, resigned himself to his fate and forfeited. Sabaku no Gara vs Rock Lee, Yash. Lee shouted, pumping his fist in the air. It is finally my turn. When the proctor started the match, Lee disappeared in a burst of speed, and used the Konoha Seppu. However the kick didn't connect as sand had shot out of the gorge strapped to Gara's back and blocked it. Lee jumped away once the sand tried to grab a hold of him. He launched himself back at Gara again, and tried to get past his defenses. Naruto who was standing next to Hiruzen along with Jiraiya whispered in his ear. This boy is also a Jinchuriki. Jiraiya then said, he contains the Ichibi. To think Suna would send an unstable Jinchuriki. That could be seen as an act of war. Serutobi listened, but dismissed their words of caution. There really wasn't anything to fear. Konoha survived the Kayubi, they could survive the Ichibi, especially if it was trapped in a human body. Besides Suna and Konoha were allies. As they were talking, Lee had just gotten flung by the sand into a wall. Lee started running around Gara, creating a dust cloud around the sand genin. Lee then shot at Gara faster than any of the other genin could see. Because of his speed, Lee was able to punch Gara straight in the face, and then run away before the sand could hit him as well. Lee then went back into the dust cloud and continued running. Fast as lightning, to some of the genin, Lee gave Gara a rising kick in the chin. Gara, however, only went slightly off the ground because of it, but Lee kept hitting him higher into the air with each punch and kick. As soon as they reached the appropriate height in the air, Lee wrapped bandages around Gara and rotated them as they started to fall to the ground. Omet Renge. Lee pushed off of Gara, allowed him to reduce the damage inflicted on himself while Gara taking the full hit. When the dust cleared, it showed Gara with multiple cracks all along his body. The cracks all across his body fell to the ground showing that it was a type of armor. The little flakes that fell on the ground turned to sand. The sand that crawled over Gara's body and reformed. A huge wave of sand covering the entire arena came and tried to swallow up Lee. The sand wrapped all around Lee, and was compressing his body. However before he could be completely crushed Lee shouted. Kaimon. Kai. The sand around his body was pushed away as a huge amount of chakra was released, and his skin turned red. Kumon. Kai. The amount of chakra being released was at least doubled. All of the wounds he had received began to heal with each passing second. Kakashi faced his friend and asked, how many of the gates can he open? It was quite impressive for a genin to even unleash the first gate since it was an extremely dangerous kinjutsu. 5. Guy said the pride evident in his voice. Simon. Kai. The chakra Lee was releasing was now tripled and his skin was turning a dark crimson red. Shoman. Kai. Lee's body was now extremely red, and it seemed like his veins were actually out of his body. Only Hanada and Neji were able to see that the veins were really chakra coils because of their Byakugan. Lee burst off the ground in an explosion of dust. The ground he stood on was now a large crater. Gara didn't have enough time to so much as breath as Lee punched him in the face. 
Gara was sent flying back and Lee appeared behind him in a burst of speed and used another kick to launch him in the air. He then sent Gara smashing into the ground with a heel drop. Lee was just so fast, that it looked like Gara was simply flying around the arena from being hit so much. Lee then did a spin off of his initial attack, the Ura Renge. Lee was able to push off before they hit and land on the ground. Unfortunately, because of opening the gates, he couldn't move his body at all, and just hoped the match was over. Gara, if anything, was not harmed, more annoyed if nothing else. Lifting up his hand, a tendril of shot towards intent on killing the person who made him feel pain for the first time in his life. Before the sand reached Lee, a dome of water surrounded him, protecting him from the sand. Gara, however, had his sand go through the water, but once it touched the water, he was unable to control it. Gara relentlessly tried to kill Lee, but found he could not do so. Naruto appeared next to the proctor and whispered in his ear. The proctor then called the match in Gara's favor since Lee was unable to move. When Gara left the floor, Guy appeared next to Naruto. Thank you, Naruto san. If you hadn't interfered, I am afraid Lee may have. It's fine, Guy san, Naruto said while he released the water dome. Lee worked very hard to get where he's at. I would be very sad if his career ended here in a pointless match. The medics took Lee away, who was now unconscious, and were going to approach Gara. They saw that he had no noticeable injuries, so they left him alone. The key helped send them away as well. Tamari walked slowly up to her brother who had now reached the balcony. She was going to touch his shoulder, but a small tendril of sand appeared on the area she was about to touch. Are you alright? She asked, lowering her hands back to her side. Gara looked at her with a blank face. Mother is silent, Gara said, as he watched Naruto converse with the Junin Sesnes from Konoha. She is wary of that ninja, she does not wish for me to kill him. When Gara said mother, she knew who he was talking about. For a biju to be wary of someone, that was very scary. The rest of the fights were rather uneventful, considering the people just finished up quickly not showing any of their real skills. Naruto had wanted to see Kabuto fight, however the shinobi forfeited for some reason. Unknown tunnel. The silver-haired medic Nin was standing in a dark hallway awaiting his master. Just then a small white snake slithered up into his range of vision. The white snake then transformed into Konoha's most hated missing Nin. Kabuto. The snake-like man hissed, What do you have for me? Kabuto pushed up the glasses on his face and hand Orochimaru several folders. The chunin you fought is Naruto Senju. Apparently he is the last male Senju, Tsunade's son to be exact, and the son of the Yandaimi Hokage. It is unknown to me if he has the Mokuton, but he is also the container of the Kayubi no Kitsune. It is also unknown if he has learned to control the Kayubi's power or not as of yet. Orochimaru nodded as he read through the folder. Looking at the picture of Naruto, he remembered Minato Namikaze. The man stole his rightful place as the Yandaimi Hokage, and then his son almost kills him. Granted he was severely weakened at the time, but he should not have been able to become so close to killing him. Keep going on with gathering information, I need to make more preparations for our attack. If all goes well I shall have the power of three Jinchuriki during this invasion. Orochimaru then stepped into the shadows and left. The end now we will see you in the next video.